Chapter 11 Mama's Shadow We had been with our doctor for one year and a half, and what exhilarating and baffling days they were. I was like a mole coming out of darkness, only to find the brilliant days weren't at all like I had supposed they would be. I'd thought, once we were free of Foxworth Hall, and I was almost an adult, life would lead me down a clear and straight path to fame, fortune, and happiness. I had the talent. I saw that in the admiring eyes of Madame and Georges. Madame especially harped on every little flaw of technique, of control. Every criticism told me I was worth all her efforts to make me not only an excellent dancer, but a sensational one. During summer vacation, Chris obtained a job as a waiter in a cafe from seven in the mornings to seven in the evenings. In August, he would leave again for Duke University, where he would begin his second year in college. Carrie fiddled away her time playing on the swing, playing with her little girl toys, though she was ten now and should be outgrowing dolls. I spent five days a week in ballet class and half of Saturday, my small sister was like a shadow tagging after me when I was at home. When I wasn't, she was Henny's shadow. She needed a playmate of her own age, but she couldn't find one. She had only the porcelain dolls to confide in, now that she felt too old to act the baby with Chris and me, and suddenly she stopped complaining about her size. But her eyes, those sad, yearning eyes, told how she longed to be as tall as the girls we saw walking in the shopping malls. Harry's loneliness hurt so much that again I thought of Mama and damned her to everlasting hell. I hoped she was hung over the eternal fires by her heels and prodded by imps with spears. More and more often I was writing Mama short notes to torment her sunny life wherever she was. She never settled down in one place long enough to receive my letters, or if she did she didn't respond. I waited for the letters to come back stamped, address unknown, but none ever did. I read the Green Glenna newspaper carefully every evening, trying to find out just what my mother was up to and where she was. Sometimes there was news. Mrs. Bartholomew Winslow left Paris and flew on to Rome to visit Italy's new chic couturier. I cut out that clipping and added it to my scrapbook. Oh, what I would do when I met up with her. Sooner or later she'd have to come to Green Glenna and live in that home of Mark Winslow's, which was newly repaired, redecorated and refurbished. I cut out that news article, too, and stared long and hard at a photograph which was not flattering. This was unusual. Customarily she could put on a brilliant smile to show the world how happy and contented she was with her life. Chris left for college in August, two weeks before I went back to high school, in late January, I would graduate. I couldn't wait to be finished with high school, so I studied like mad. The autumn days flew swiftly by, so much in contrast to other autumns when time had crept monotonously while we grew older and youth was stolen from us. Just keeping track of my mother's activities kept me busy, and then when I really put my nose on the trail of Bart's family history, I used up more of my precious time. In Green Glenna, I pored for hours over old books written about the founding families of Green Glenna. His ancestors had arrived just about the same time mine had back in the 18th century, and they too had been from England, settling down in Virginia in the part that was now North Carolina. I looked up and stared into space. Was it just a coincidence that his ancestors and mine had been part of that lost colony? Some of the husbands had sailed back to England for more supplies, only to return much later and find their colony abandoned, with not one single survivor to tell why. After the Revolution, the Winslows had moved to South Carolina. How odd! Now the Foxworths, too, were in South Carolina. Not a day passed as I shopped and travelled on the busy streets of Green Glenna that I didn't expect to see my mother. I stared after every blonde I saw. I went into expensive shops looking for her. Snobbish sales ladies would come up silently behind me and inquire if they could help. Of course they couldn't help. I was looking for my mother and she wasn't hanging from a clothes rack. 
But she was in town. The society column had given me this information. Any day I would see her. One sunny Saturday, I was rushing to do an errand for Madame Marisha when I suddenly spotted on the sidewalk ahead of me a man and a woman so familiar my heart almost stopped beating. It was them. Just to see her strolling so casually at his side, enjoying herself, put me in a state of panic. Sour gall rose in my throat. I dared to draw nearer, so I was very close behind them. If she turned, she'd be sure to see me. And what would I do then? Spit in her face? Yes, I would like to do that. I could trip her and make her fall and watch how she lost her dignity. That would be nice. But I didn't do anything but tremble and feel ill as I listened to them talk. Her voice was so soft and sweet, so cultivated and genteel. I marveled at how svelte she still was, how lovely her pale, gleaming hair that waved softly back from her face. When she turned her head to speak again to the man at her side, I saw her profile. I sighed. Oh, God, my mother in that expensive rose-colored suit, the beautiful mother I had loved so well, my murdering mother who could still take my heart and wring it dry, for once I had loved her so very much and trusted her. And deep inside of me was that little girl, like Carrie, who still wanted a mother to love. Why, Mama? Why did you have to love money more than you loved your children? I stifled the sobs that she might have heard. My emotions raged out of control. I wanted to run up and scream accusations before her husband and shock him and terrify her. I also wanted to run up and throw my arms about her, cry out her name and plead that she love me again. But all the tempestuous emotions I felt were submerged in the tidal wave of spite and vengeance, I felt. I didn't accost her, for I wasn't ready to face her yet. I wasn't rich or famous. I wasn't anybody special, and she was still a great beauty. She was one of the wealthiest women in the area, and also one of the luckiest. I dared much that day, but they didn't turn to see me. My mother was not the type to look behind her or stare at passers-by. She was accustomed to being the one who drew all the admiring glances. Like a queen among peasants, she strolled as if no one was on the street but her and her young husband. When I had my fill of viewing her, I looked at her husband and drank up the special kind of virile, panther-like handsomeness that was his. He no longer sported a huge, thick moustache. His dark hair was waved smoothly back and was styled modishly. He reminded me a bit of Julian. Julian. The words my mother and her husband exchanged weren't particularly revealing. They were discussing what restaurant they should dine in, and did he think the furniture they'd shopped for this afternoon could be bettered if they shopped in New York. I do love the break front we chose, she said in a voice that brought back my childhood. It reminds me so much of the one I bought just before Chris was killed. Oh, yes, that break front had cost $2,500 and was so needed to balance one end of the living room. Then Daddy died on the highway, and everything unpaid for was repossessed, including the break front. I followed where they led, daring fate to let them see me. They were here, living in the home of Bart Winslow. As I tagged along, full of vengeful schemes, despising her, admiring him, I planned which way to hurt her most. And what did I do? I chickened out. I did nothing, absolutely nothing. Furious with myself, I went home and raged in front of the mirror, hating my image because it was her all over. Damn it to hell! I picked up a heavy paperweight from the special little French provincial desk Paul had bought me, and I hurled it straight at the mirror. There, Mama, you're broken in pieces now. Gone, gone, gone. Then I was crying, and later a workman came and replaced the glass in the mirror frame. Fool! That's what I was. Now I'd wasted some of the money I was planning to use for a wonderful gift for Paul's 42nd birthday. Someday I'd get even, and in a way in which I wouldn't be hurt. It would be more than just a broken mirror.
much, much more. Chapter 12 A Birthday Gift Medical conventions ruined many a plan of mine, as did patients. On this unique day, I skipped ballet class to rush straight home from high school. I found Henny in the kitchen, slaving over a gourmet menu I had planned, all Paul's favorite dishes. A Creole jambalaya with shrimp, crab meat, rice, green bell peppers, onions, garlic, mushrooms, and so many other things, I thought I'd never finish measuring out half teaspoons of this and that. Then all the mushrooms and other vegetables had to be sautéed, it was a troublesome dish I wasn't likely to make again. No sooner was this in the other than I began another cake from scratch. The first was sunk in the middle and was soggy. I covered up the hollow with thick frosting and gave it to the neighborhood kids. Henny bustled and bumbled around, shaking her head and throwing me critical glances. I had the last rose squeezed from the pastry tube when Chris dashed in the back door bearing his gift. "'Am I late?' he asked breathlessly. "'I can't stay longer than nine o'clock. "'I have to be back at Duke before roll call.' "'You're just in time,' I said, all flustered "'and in a flurry to get upstairs and bathe and dress. "'You set the table while Henny finishes up with a salad.' "'It was beneath his dignity, of course, to set a table, "'but for once he obliged without complaint. "'I shampooed my hair and set it on large rollers.' and polished my nails a glowing silvery pink, my toenails too. I painted my face with an expertise born of hours of practice and long consultations with Madame Marisha and the beauty assistants in the department stores. When I was done, no one would have guessed I was only seventeen. Down the stairs I drifted, borne aloft by the admiration that shone from my brother's eyes and by the envy from Carrie's and a big grin that split Henny's face from ear to ear. Fussily, I arranged the table again, changing around the noisemakers, the snappers, and the colourful, ridiculous paper clown hats. Chris blew up a few balloons and suspended them from the chandelier, and then we all sat down to wait for Paul to come and enjoy his surprise party. When he didn't show up and the hours passed, I got up to pace the floor, as Mama had done on Daddy's 36th birthday party when he never came home, not ever. Finally, Chris had to leave. Then Carrie began to yawn and complain. We fed her and let her go to bed. She slept in her own room now, especially decorated in purple and red. Next, it was only Henny and me watching TV, as the Creole casserole kept warming and drying out, and our salad was wilting, and then Henny yawned and left for bed. Now I was left alone to pace and worry, my party ruined. At ten... I heard Paul's car turn into the drive, and through the back door he strode, bearing with him the two suitcases he'd taken to Chicago. He tossed me a casual greeting before he noticed my fancy attire. Hey, he said, throwing a suspicious glance into the dining room and seeing the party decorations. Have I somehow managed to spoil something you planned? He was so damned casual about being three hours late I could have killed him if I hadn't loved him so much. Like those who always try to hide the truth, I lit into him. Why did you have to go to that medical convention in the first place? You might have guessed we'd have special plans for your birthday, and then you go and call us up and tell us what time to expect you home, and then you're three hours late. My flight was delayed, he started to explain. I've been slaving to make you a cake that tastes as good as your mother's, I interrupted, and then you don't show up. I brushed past him and pulled the casserole from the oven. "'I'm ravenous,' said Paul, humbly, apologetically. "'If you haven't eaten, we might as well make the most of what looks like it could have been a very festive and happy occasion. Have mercy on me, Kathy. I don't control the weather.' I nodded stiffly to indicate I was at least a little understanding. He smiled and lightly brushed the back of his hand over my cheek. You look absolutely exquisite, he breathed softly. So take the frown off your face and get things ready, and I'll be down in ten minutes. In ten minutes he had showered and shaved and changed into fresh clothes. 
By the light of four candles, the two of us sat down at the long dining table with me to his left. I had arranged this meal so I wouldn't have to hop up and down to serve him. Everything that was needed was put upon a serving cart. The dishes that had to be served hot were on electrical heating units, and the champagne was cooling in a bucket. The champagne is from Chris, I explained. He's developed a liking for it. He lifted the champagne bottle from the ice and glanced at the label. It's a good year. It must have been expensive. Your brother has developed gourmet taste. We ate slowly, and it seemed whenever I lifted my eyes, they met with his. He'd come home looking tired, mussy. Now he looked completely refreshed. He'd been gone two long, long weeks. Dead weeks that made me miss his presence in the open doorway of my bedroom as I practiced at the bar doing my warm-up exercises before breakfast to beautiful music that sent my soul soaring. When our meal was over, I dashed into the kitchen, then glided back bearing a gorgeous coconut cake with miniature green candles fitted into red roses made of icing. Across the top I'd written as skillfully as I could with that pastry tube, Happy Birthday to Paul. What do you think? Paul asked after he blew out the candles. Think about what? I questioned back, carefully setting down the cake with twenty-six candles, for that was the age he appeared to me and the age I wanted him to be. I felt very much an adolescent, floundering in the world of adult quicksand. My short, formal gown was flame-coloured chiffon with shoestring straps and lots of cleavage showing. But if my attempt to look sophisticated had succeeded, inside I was in a daze as I tried to play the role of seductress. My moustache, surely you've noticed. You've been staring at it for half an hour. It's nice, I stammered, blushing as red as my gown. It becomes you. Now, ever since you came, you've been hinting how much more handsome and appealing I'd be with a moustache. And now that I've taken the trouble to grow one, you say it's nice. Nice is such a weak word, Catherine. It's because... because you do look so handsome, I stumbled, that I can only find weak words. I fear that Thelma Merkel has already found all the strong words to flatter you. How the hell do you know about her? He fired this at me as he narrowed his beautiful eyes. Gosh, he should know. Gossip. And so I told him this. I went to that hospital where Thelma Merkel is the head nurse on the third floor, and I sat just beyond the nurse's station and watched her for a couple of hours. In my opinion, she's not quite beautiful, but handsome, and she seemed to me terribly bossy. And she flirts with all the doctors, in case you don't know that. I left him laughing with his eyes lit up. Thelma Merkel was a head nurse in the Claremont Memorial Hospital, and everyone there seemed to know she had her mind set on becoming the second Mrs. Paul Scott Sheffield. But she was only a nurse in a sterile white uniform miles and miles away. I was under his nose, with my intoxicating new perfume tickling his senses, as the advertisement had said, a bewitching, beguiling, seductive scent no man could resist. What chance did Thelma Merkel, aged twenty-nine, have against the likes of me? I was giddy from three glasses of Chris's imported champagne, and hardly alert at all when Paul began to open the gifts Carrie, Chris, and I had saved up to buy for him. I'd embroidered for him a cruel painting of his gingerbread white house with trees showing above the roof and a part of the brick wall to the sides with a little of the flowers showing. Chris had sketched it for me and I'd slaved many hours to make it perfect. It's a stunningly beautiful work of art, he said, with impressed awe. I couldn't help but think of the grandmother and how she'd cruelly rejected our tedious and hopeful gesture to win her friendship. Thank you very much, Catherine, for thinking so much of me. I'm going to hang it in my office where all my patients can see it. Tears flooded my eyes, smeared my mascara as I furtively tried to blot them away before he realized it wasn't just the candlelight making me this beautiful, but three hours of preparation. He didn't notice the tears 
or my handkerchief that came from the cleavage of my low-cut gown. He was still admiring the small stitches I'd so carefully made. He put the gift aside, caught my glance with his own shining eyes, and stood to help me up. It's too beautiful a night to go to bed, he said, as he glanced at his watch. I've got a yearning to walk in the garden by moonlight. Do you ever have yearnings like that? Yearnings? I was made of yearnings, half of them adolescent and too fanciful to ever come true. Yet as I strolled by his side through the magic of his Japanese garden and over the little red lacquered footbridge, and as we ascended marble steps and walked on hand in hand, I felt we'd both entered a magical never-never land. It was the marble statues, of course, life-size marble statues standing in their cold and perfect nudity. The breezes were blowing the Spanish moss, and Paul had to duck to escape it, while I could stand straight and smile, because having height did cause a few problems I could escape. "'You're laughing at me, Catherine,' he said, just as Chris used to tease and separate my name into slow and distinct syllables, "'My Lady Catherine.' I ran on ahead and down the marble steps to the center where Rodin's The Kiss dominated the garden. Everything seemed silvery, bluish, and unreal, and the moon was big and bright, full and smiling, with long, dark clouds streaking its face and making it seem sinister one moment and gay the next. I sighed, for it was like that strange night that put Chris and me up on the roof of Foxworth Hall both of us fearful we'd roast over the eternal fires of hell. "'It's a pity you were here with me and not with that beautiful boy you dance with,' said Paul, yanking me back from thoughts of yesterday. "'Julian?' I asked in surprise. "'He's in New York this week, but I suspect he'll be back again next week.' "'Oh,' he said, "'then next week will belong to him and not me. "'That all depends. "'On what?' Sometimes I want him and sometimes I don't. Sometimes he seems just a boy and I want a man. Then again, sometimes he's very sophisticated and that impresses me. And when I dance with him, I fall madly in love with the prince he's supposed to be. He looks so splendid in those costumes. Yeah, he said. I've noticed that myself. His hair is jet black, while yours is sort of brownish, smoky black. I suppose jet black is more romantic than brownish, smoky black, he teased. That all depends. Catherine, you are female through and through. Stop giving me enigmatic answers. I'm not enigmatic. I'm just telling you love isn't enough, nor romance. I want skills to see me through life, so I'll never have to lock away my children to inherit a fortune I didn't earn. I want to know how to earn a buck and see us through, even if we don't have a man to lean on and support us. Catherine, Catherine, he said softly, taking both my hands in his and holding them tight. How hurt you've been by your mother. You sound so adult, so hard. Don't let bitter memories deprive you of one of your greatest assets, your soft, loving ways. A man likes to take care of the woman he loves and his children. A man likes to be leaned on, looked up to, respected. An aggressive, domineering woman is one of God's most fearsome creatures. I yanked free of him and ran on to the swing and threw myself down on the seat. I pushed myself high, higher, fast, faster, flying so high it took me back to the attic and the swings there when the nights were long and stuffy. Now here I was, free on the outside and swinging crazily to put myself back into the attic. It was seeing Mama and her husband again that was making me desperate, making me want what should be put off until I was older. I flew so high, so wild, so abandoned, my skirts fanned up into my face and made me blind. Dizzy, I suddenly fell to the ground. Paul came running to my side, falling down on his knees to lift me up in his arms. "'Are you hurt?' he asked, and kissed me before I could answer. "'No, not hurt. I was a dancer who knew how to fall.' He started murmuring the love words I needed to hear between his kisses, 
that came slower and lasted longer, and the look in his eyes made me fill with a drunkenness far headier and far more sparkling than any imported French champagne. My lips parted beneath his prolonged kiss. I gasped because his tongue touched mine. His kisses came soft, moist on my eyelids, my cheeks, my chin, neck, shoulders, cleavage, as his hands endlessly roamed and sought all my most intimate places. Catherine, he gasped, pulling away and gazing down at me with his eyes on fire. You're only a child. We can't let this happen. I swore I'd never let this happen, not with you. Useless words that I snuffed out by encircling his neck with my arms. My fingers sank into the thickness of his dark hair as I murmured huskily, I wanted to give you a shiny silver Cadillac for your birthday, but I didn't have enough money, so I thought I'd give you second best. Me. He moaned softly. I can't let you do this. You don't owe me. I laughed and kissed him, shamelessly kissed him long and deep. Paul, it's you who owes me. You've given me too many long, desiring looks to tell me you don't want me now. If you say that, you're lying. You think of me as a child, but I grew up a long time ago. Don't love me. I don't care. For I love you, and that's enough. I know you love me the way I want to be loved, because even though you won't admit it, you do love me and want me. The moon lit up his eyes and made them shine. Even as he said, No, you're a fool to think it will work. His eyes were speaking differently. To my way of thinking, his very restraint proved exactly how very much he did love me. If he had loved me less, he would have eagerly taken long ago what I wouldn't have denied. So when he made a move to rise, to leave me and have done with temptation... I took his hand and put it where it would pleasure me most. He groaned. I groaned even louder when I put my hand where it would pleasure him most. Shameless what I did, I knew it. I shut off my thoughts of what Chris would think, of how the grandmother would consider me a scarlet harlot. Oh, was it fortunate, or just the opposite, that that book in Mama's nightstand drawer had shown me well what to do to pleasure a man and how to respond? I thought he would take me there on the grass under the stars, but he picked me up and carried me back into the house. Up the back stairs he stole quietly. Neither of us spoke, though my lips travelled over his neck and face. Far off, in the room to the rear of the kitchen, I could hear Henny's TV as she listened to a late-night talk show. On his bed he laid me down, and with his eyes alone he began his love-making, and in his eyes I drowned and things grew blurry as my emotions swelled higher like a tidal wave engulfing both of us. Skin to skin we pressed, just holding close at first and thrilling in the exaltation of sharing what the other had to give. With each touch of his lips, of his hands, I was shot through with electrifying sensations until at last I was wild to have him enter me, no longer tender but fervent with his own fierce demanding need to reach the same heights I was seeking. Catherine, hurry, hurry, come. What was he talking about? I was there beneath him doing what I could. Come where? He was slippery and wet with sweat. My legs were raised and clutched about his waist, and I could feel the terrible effort of his restraint as he kept telling me to come, come, come. Then he groaned and gave up. Hot juices spurted forth to warm up my insides pleasantly five or six times. And then it was over, all over, and he was pulling out. And I hadn't reached any mountain high, or heard bells ringing, or felt myself exploding, not as he had. It was all over his face, relaxed and at peace now, vaguely smeared with joy. How easy for men, I thought, while I still wanted more. There I was on the verge of Fourth of July fireworks, and it was all over. All over but for his sleepy hands that roamed over my body, exploring all hills and crevices before he fell asleep. 
Now his heavy leg was thrown over mine. I was left staring up at the ceiling with tears in my eyes. Goodbye, Christopher Dahl. Now you are set free. Sunlight through the window wakened me early. Paul was propped up on an elbow, gazing dreamily down at me. You are so beautiful, so young, so desirable. You aren't sorry, are you? I hope you don't wish now you had done it differently. I snuggled closer against his bare skin. Explain one thing, please. Why did you keep asking me to come? He roared with laughter. <laughs> Catherine, my love, he finally managed. I nearly killed myself trying to hold back until you could climax. And now you lie there with those big, innocent blue eyes and ask me what I meant? I thought those dancing playmates of yours had explained everything to you. Don't tell me there is one subject you haven't read about in a book. Well, there was a book I found in Mama's night table drawer, but I just looked at the photographs. I never read the text, though Chris did, but then he stole more often to our bedroom suite than I did. He cleared his throat. I could tell you what I meant by what I said, but uh, demonstrating would be more fun. Really, you don't have the least idea? Yes, I said defensively. Of course I do. I'm supposed to feel stunned by lightning bolts, so I stiffen out and go unconscious, and then I'm split wide apart into atoms that float around in space and then gather together and sizzle me with tingles so I can float back to reality with dream stars in my eyes, like you had. Catherine, don't make me love you too much. He sounded serious, as if I'd hurt him if he did. I'll try to love you the way you want. I'll shave first, he said, throwing back the covers and making ready to get up. I reached to pull him back. I like the way you look now, so dark and dangerous. Eagerly I surrendered to all Paul's desires. We developed delicate ways of keeping our trysts secret from Henny. On Henny's day off, I washed the bed linens that were duplicates of the ones soiled that I hid away until they could be washed. Carrie could have been in another world, she was so unobservant. But when Chris was home, we had to be more discreet and not even look at each other, lest we betray ourselves. I felt strange with Chris now, like I'd betrayed him. I didn't know how long the rapture between Paul and me would last. I longed for passion undying, for ecstasy everlasting. Yet my suspicious self guessed nothing as glorious as what Paul and I had could go on indefinitely. He would soon tire of me, a child whose mental capacities couldn't compete with his, and he'd go back to his old ways, maybe with Thelma Merkel. Maybe Thelma Merkel had gone with him to that medical convention, though I was wise enough not to question him ever about what he did when I wasn't with him. I wanted to give him everything Julia had denied and give gladly, with no recriminations when we parted. But in the moment of our flaming obsession with each other, I felt so large, so generous, and I gloated in our selfless abandonment. And I think the grandmother, with her talk of evil and sin, had made it ten times more exciting because it was so very, very wicked. And then again I'd flounder, not wanting Chris to think I was wicked. Oh, it mattered so much to me what Chris would think. Please, God, let Chris know why I'm doing this. And I do love Paul, I do. After Thanksgiving, Chris still had a few days of vacation, and while we were at the dinner table with Henny hovering nearby, Paul asked all of us what we wanted for Christmas. This would be our third Christmas with Paul. In late January, I'd be graduating from high school. I didn't have much time to go, for my next step, I hoped, would be New York. I spoke up and told Paul what I wanted for Christmas. I wanted to go to Foxworth Hall. Chris's eyes widened and Carrie began to cry. No, said Chris firmly. We will not open healed wounds. My wounds are not healed, I stated just as firmly. They will never be healed until justice is done. Chapter 13 Foxworth Hall from the Outside 
The minute the words left my mouth, he shouted, No! Why can't you let bygones be bygones? Because I am not like you, Christopher. You like to pretend that Corey didn't die of arsenic poisoning but of pneumonia because you feel more comfortable with that. Yet you were the one who convinced me she was the one who did it. So why can't we go up there and see for ourselves if any hospital has a record of Corey's death? Corey could have died of pneumonia. He had all the symptoms. How lamely he said that, knowing full well he was protecting her. Now wait a minute, said Paul who had kept quiet and spoke only when he saw the fire blazing from my eyes. If Kathy feels she must do this thing, why not, Chris? Though if your mother admitted Corey to a hospital under a false name, it won't be easy to check up. She had a fake name put on his tombstone, too, said Chris, giving me a long, hateful look. Paul gave that some thought, wondering aloud how we could find a grave when we didn't know the name. I believed I had all the answers. If she registered Corey in a hospital for treatment under a certain name, then naturally she'd use the same name when he was buried. And, Paul, since you're a doctor, you can gain entry to all the hospital records, right? You really want to do this? he asked. It's sure to bring back a lot of unhappy memories, and like Chris just said, open up healed wounds. My wounds are not healed and will never be healed. I want to put flowers on Corey's grave. I think it will comfort Carrie to know where he's buried. Then we can visit him from time to time. Chris, you don't have to go if you are so dead set against it. What I wanted, Paul tried to deliver, despite Chris's opposition. Chris did travel with us to Charlottesville, riding in the back seat with Carrie. Paul went inside several hospitals and charmed the nurses into giving him the records he wanted. He looked and I looked while Carrie and Chris stayed outside. Not one eight-year-old boy had died of pneumonia two years ago in late October. Not only that, the cemeteries didn't have a record of a child his age being buried. Still stubbornly determined, I had to trek through all the cemeteries, feeling Mama might have lied and put Dolanganger on his headstone after all. Carrie cried, for Corey was supposed to be in heaven, not in the ground, lightly frosted with a recent snowfall. Fruitless, time-consuming, unrewarding waste. As far as the world was concerned, no male child of eight years had died in the months of October and November 1960. Chris insisted we go back to Paul's. He tried to persuade me that I didn't really want to see Foxworth Hall. I whirled to glare at Chris. I do want to go there. We do have time. Why come this far and turn back without seeing that house? At least once, in the daylight, on the outside. Why not? It was Paul who reasoned with Chris by telling him I needed to see the house. And to be honest, Chris, I'd like to see it myself brooding sullenly in the back seat beside Carrie, Chris relented. Carrie cried as Paul headed his car toward the climbing mountain roads that Mama and her husband must have traversed thousands of times. Paul stopped at a gas station to ask directions to Foxworth Hall. Easily we could have guided Paul to Foxworth Hall if we knew where the train tracks were and could find the mail depot that was a stop-off point. Beautiful country, said Paul as he drove. Eventually we did come upon that grand house that sat all alone on a mountainside. That's the one, I cried, terribly excited. It was huge as a hotel, with double wings that jutted out front and back from the long main stem, constructed of pink brick with black shutters at all the windows. The black slate roof was so sharply pitched it looked scary. How had we ever dared to walk up there? I counted the eight chimneys, the four sets of dormer windows in the attic. Look over there, Paul, I directed, pointing out the two windows on the northern wing where we had been held prisoners for so long, waiting endlessly for our grandfather to die. While Paul stared at those two windows, I looked up at the dormer windows of the attic and saw that the fallen slat from one of the black shutters had been replaced. There wasn't a scorch mark anywhere or signs of a fire, 
The house hadn't burned. God hadn't sent an errant breeze to blow the candle flame until it caught a dangling paper flower on fire. God wasn't going to punish our mother or the grandmother, not for anything. All of a sudden, Carrie let out a loud howl. I want Mama, she screamed. Kathy, Chris, that's where we used to live with Corey. Let's go inside. I want Mama. Please let me see my real Mama. It was frightful the way she cried and pleaded. How could she remember the house? It had been dark the night we arrived, with the twins so sleepy they couldn't have seen anything. The morning we stole away, it was before dawn, and we'd left by the back door. What was it that told Carrie this was our prison of yesteryears? Then I knew it was the house lower down the street. We were at the end of the cul-de-sac and up much higher. We'd often peeked out the windows of our locked room and gazed down on all the fine houses, forbidden to look out of the windows, and yet we dared on occasion. What had been accomplished by our long journey? Nothing. Nothing at all except more proof that our mother was a liar beyond belief. I mulled it over day after day, even when I was perched on one of the built-in shower seats as Paul lathered my hair and carefully began to wash it. The long length couldn't be piled on top and screwed around or I'd never get out the tangles. He did it the way I'd taught him, working the soapy lather from scalp to ends, and when it was over he'd dry it, brush it free of tangles, and all around me it would fall like a silken shawl to cover my nakedness, like Eve must have covered hers. Paul, I asked, my eyes downcast, it's not sinful what we're doing, is it? I keep thinking of the grandmother and all her talk of evil. Tell me that love makes this all right. Open your eyes, Kathy, he said softly, using a washcloth to wipe away the suds before I did. Look at what you see. A naked man, the way God planned him to be. When I'd looked, he tilted my face upwards and then lifted me so he could hold me close. Holding me in his tight embrace, he began to talk, and every word he said told me our love was beautiful and right. I couldn't speak. Silently, I cried inside, for so easily I could have ended up the prude the grandmother wanted to make of me. Like a young child, I allowed him to dry me off and brush my hair and do what he would with his kisses and caresses until the embers, always ready between us, caught fire and he picked me up and carried me to his bed. When our passion was sated, I lay in the circle of his arms and thought of all I could do, things that would have shocked me as a child, things that once I would have considered terribly gross, ugly, for I had thought then only of the acts and not of the feelings of giving. How strange that people were born so sensual and had to be stifled for so many years. I recalled the first time his tongue had touched me there and the electrifying jolt I'd felt. Oh, I could kiss Paul everywhere and feel no shame, for loving him was better than smelling roses on a sunny summer day, better than dancing to beautiful music with the best of all partners. That was what loving Paul was like for me when I was seventeen and he was forty-two. He had restored me and made me whole and deeper down I shoved the remorse I felt for Corey. There was hope for Chris. He was alive. There was hope for Carrie that she could grow and find love too. And maybe, if things turned out right, there was hope for me too. Chapter 14 Toward the Top Julian didn't fly down as often as he used to, and his mother and father complained about this. When he did come, he danced better than ever, but not once did I see him glance my way. I had the suspicion, though, he did plenty of looking when he knew I couldn't see him. I was getting better, more disciplined, more controlled, and I worked. Oh, how I worked! From the very first I'd been included in the professional group of the Rosenkopf Ballet Company, but only as a member of the corps de ballet. This Christmas we were to alternate performances of The Nutcracker and Cinderella. Long after the others had gone home, 
I had the dance studio all to myself on a Friday afternoon, and I was lost in the world of the sugar plum fairy, intent on giving this role something different, when suddenly Julian was dancing with me. He was like my shadow, doing what I did, even pirouetting, making a mockery of what I did. He frowned, then grabbed up a towel to dry his face and hair. I wiggled my toes and started toward the dressing room. I was going out to dinner with Paul that evening. Kathy, hold up, he called. I know you don't like me. I don't. He grinned wickedly, leaning forward to stare into my eyes. His lips brushed my cheek as I cringed away. Then he had me pinioned in his arms with his palms flat against the wall to prevent my running away. You know what? I think you should be the one to dance Clara or Cinderella. He tickled under my chin, then kissed near my ear. If you're nice to me, I could see to it that you dance both lead roles. I ducked and ran. Come off it, Julian, I flared. Your favors would demand a price, and you don't interest me. Ten minutes later, I had showered and dressed and was ready to leave the building when Julian showed up in his street clothes. Kathy, seriously, I think you're ready for New York now. Marisha thinks so, too. His smile was wry, as if his mother's opinion wasn't as worthy as his own. No strings attached. Not unless someday you decide you want strings. Now I didn't know what to say, so I said nothing. I did get chosen for both the roles for the Rosenkopf performances. I thought the other girls would be jealous and resentful, but instead they applauded when it was announced. We all worked well together, making it one merry, hectic time. Then came my debut as Cinderella. Julian didn't even knock before he entered the girls' dressing room to survey me in my costume of rags and tatters. Stop being so damned nervous. There are only people out there. You don't think I'd come back here to dance with a girl who wasn't sensational, do you? As we stood in the wings, his arm stayed about my shoulders, lending me confidence as we both counted toward my cue to go on. His part didn't come until much later. I couldn't see Paul, Chris, Carrie or Henny out in the darkened audience. I trembled more as the footlights dimmed and the overture was played, and then the curtain rose. My mounting anxiety disappeared and took all my insecurity along with it, as some astonishing kinesthetic memory took over, and I allowed the music to control and direct me. I wasn't Kathy, or Catherine, or anybody but Cinderella. I swept ashes from the hearth and enviously watched two hateful stepsisters prepare for the ball, feeling love and romance would never come into my life. If I made mistakes, if my technique wasn't perfect, I didn't know it. I was in love with the dance, with performing before a large audience, with being young and pretty, and most of all I was in love with life and all it had to offer outside of Foxworth Hall. Red, yellow and pink roses came to fill my arms. I thrilled when the audience rose to give us a standing ovation. Three times I handed Julian a rose of a different colour, each time our eyes met and clung. See, his was saying to me mutely, we do create magic together. We are the perfect dancing partners. He cornered me again during the buffet party. Now you've had a taste of what it's like, he said softly and persuasively, his dark eyes pleading. Can you give up the applause? Can you keep on staying here in a hick town when New York is waiting for you? Kathy, as a team, we'll be sensational. We look so right together. I dance with you better than I dance with any other ballerina. Oh, Kathy, you and I could reach the top so much sooner together. I swear to take good care of you. I look out for you and never let you feel lonely. I don't know, I said miserably, though I was lit up inside. I have to finish high school first. But do you really think I'm good enough? Up there they expect the best. You are the best. Trust me, believe in me. Madame Zolta's company isn't the largest or top rank, but she's got what it takes to make our company rate as high as the larger and older ones 
once she has a couple of fantastic dancers like us. I asked what Madame Zolta was like. Somehow that made him confident I'd already agreed, and laughing first he managed to plant a kiss on my lips. You're going to adore Madame Zolta. She's Russian, and the sweetest, kindest, most gentle little old lady you ever met. She'll be like your mother. Good God. She knows everything there is about dance. She's our doctor sometimes, our psychologist. Whatever we need, she's it. Life in New York is like living on Mars compared to here. Another world, a better world. In no time at all, you'll love it. I'll take you to famous restaurants where you'll eat food such as you've never tasted before. I'll introduce you to movie stars, TV celebrities, actors, actresses, authors. I tried to resist him by fastening my eyes on Chris, Carrie, and Paul, but Julian moved so he blocked out my view. All I could see was him. It's the kind of life you were born for, Kathy. And this time he sounded sincere and deeply earnest. Why have you studied and put yourself through so much torture if not for success? Can you achieve the kind of fame you want here? No, I couldn't. But Paul was here. Chris and Carrie were here. How could I leave them? Kathy, come with me to where you belong, behind the footlights, on stage with roses in your arms. Come with me, Kathy, and make my dreams come true, too. Oh, he was winning that night, and I was heady with my first success, and even when I wanted to say no, I nodded and said, Yes, I'll go, but only if you come down here and fly with me. I've never been on a plane, and I wouldn't know where to go once I landed. He took me in his arms then, tenderly, and held me as his lips brushed my hair. Over his shoulder I could see both Chris and Paul staring our way, both of them looking astonished and more than a little hurt. In January of 1963 I graduated from high school. I wasn't particularly brilliant like Chris, but I'd made it through. Chris was so smart it was more than likely he'd finish college in three years rather than four. Already he'd won several scholarships to help take the financial burden of his education from Paul's shoulders, though he never mentioned a word about any of us paying him back for anything. It was understood, though, that Chris would become an associate with Paul when he had his M.D. I marveled that Paul could keep spending on us and never complain. And when I asked, he explained, I enjoy knowing I'm helping to contribute to the world the wonderful doctor Chris will make and the super ballerina you will be one day. He looked so sad when he said that, so terribly sad. As for Carrie, I hope she decides to stay home with me and marry a local boy so I can see her often. When I'm gone, it will be Thelma Merkel for you again, won't it? I asked with some bitterness, for I wanted him to stay faithful, no matter how many miles I put between us. Maybe, he said. You won't love anyone else as much as you love me. Say you won't. He smiled. No, how could I love anyone as much as I love you? No other could dance into my heart the way you did, could she? Paul, don't mock me. Say the word and I won't go. I'll stay. How can I say the words to make you stay when you have to fulfill your destiny? You were born to dance, not to be the wife of a stodgy small-town doctor. Marriage? He'd said wife. He'd never mentioned marriage before. It was more than awful to tell Carrie I was leaving. Her screams were deafening and pitiful. You cannot go, she bellowed, tears streaming. You promised we would all stay together, and now you and Chris both go away and leave me. Take me, too. Take me. She beat at me with small fists, kicked at my legs, determined to inflict some pain for what Chris and I were giving her. And already I felt pain enough for the world in leaving her. Please try and understand, Carrie. I will be coming back, and Chris will, too. You won't be forgotten. I hate you, she screamed. I hate both you and Chris. I hope you die in New York. I hope you both fall down and die. It was Paul who came to save me. You've still got me every day, and Henny, he said, hefting Carrie's slight weight up in his arms. We're not going anywhere. And you'll be the only daughter we have when Kathy is gone. Come, dry your tears. 
Put a smile on your face and be happy for your sister. Remember, this is what she'd been striving for all those long years when you were locked up. I ached inside as I wondered if I really wanted a dance career as much as I had always thought. Chris threw me a long, sad look, then bent to pick up my new blue suitcases. He hurried out the front door, trying not to let me see the tears in his eyes. When we all went out, he stood near Paul's white car, his shoulders squared off, his face set, determined not to show any emotion. Henny had to pile in with the rest of us. She didn't want to be left home to cry alone. Her so eloquent brown eyes spoke to me, wishing me good luck as her hands were kept busy wiping the tears from Carrie's face. At the airport, Julian paced back and forth, constantly glancing at his watch. He was afraid I'd back out and wouldn't show up. He looked very handsome in his new suit, as his eyes lit up when he saw me approach. Thank God! I was thinking I flew down here for nothing, and I wouldn't do this twice. The evening before, I'd already said a private goodbye to Paul. His words rang in my ears to haunt me, even as I boarded the plane. We both knew it couldn't last, Catherine. From the beginning, I warned you, April just can't marry with September. Chris and Paul followed us up the ramp to help with the many pieces of hand luggage I wouldn't trust to the baggage compartment, and once more I had to hug Paul close. "'Thank you, Catherine,' he whispered, so neither Chris nor Julian could overhear. "'For everything. Don't look back with any regrets. Forget about me. Forget all the past. Concentrate on your dancing and wait before you fall in love with anyone, and let it be someone near your own age.' choking, I asked. And what about you? He forced a smile and then a chuckle. Don't worry about me. I've got my memories of a beautiful ballerina and that's enough. I burst into tears. Memories. What were they? Just something to torture yourself with, that's all. Blindly, I turned to find myself locked in Chris's arms. My Christopher doll, who was six feet tall now, my knight so gallant, chivalrous and sensitive. Finally I could pull away, and then he took my hands, both of them as our gazes met and locked. We too had shared a great deal, even more than Paul and I. Goodbye, my walking, talking, cheerful, chiding and living set of encyclopedias, my fellow prisoner of hope. You don't need to cry for me. Cry for yourself. Or don't cry at all. It's over. Accept it, Chris, like I have, like you have to. You're only my brother. I'm only a sister. And the world is full of beautiful women who'd love you better than I can or could. Every word I didn't speak, I knew he heard. And still he kept on looking at me with his heart in his eyes, making me hurt all over. Kathy, he said hoarsely, loud enough for Julian to hear. It's not that I'm afraid you won't make it. I'm sure you will if you don't get so damned impulsive. Please don't do anything reckless that you'll regret later on. Promise to think of all the ramifications first before you jump in with both feet. Go easy on sex and love. Wait until you're old enough to know what you want in a man before you choose one. I'm sure my smile was crooked, for already I'd chosen Paul. I flicked my eyes from Paul, who looked serious, to Julian, who was frowning and glaring at Chris, then at Paul. "'You go easy on sex and love, too,' I said jokingly to Chris, making sure my tone was light. I hugged him tight once more, hurting to let him go. "'And write to me often, and come to New York with Paul, Carrie and Henny whenever you can, or come alone, but come. Promise?' Solemnly he promised. Our lips met briefly, and then I turned to take my seat near the window. Since this was my first plane trip, Julian graciously gave up that privilege. I waved like mad to my family, who I couldn't even see from the plane window. Julian, so adroit and adept on stage, was at a loss when it came to handling a girl who sobbed on his shoulder, trembling, already homesick, wishing she wasn't going, even before the plane was 5,000 feet up. "'You've got me,' he said smoothly. "'Didn't I swear to take care of you? "'And I will, honest to God. "'I'll do everything possible to make you happy.' "'He grinned at me and kissed me lightly. 
And, my love, I'm afraid I exaggerated the charms of Madame Zolta just a wee, wee bit, as you'll soon find out. I stared at him. What do you mean? He cleared his throat, and without the slightest embarrassment, he told me about his first meeting with the once famous Russian dancer. I don't want to spoil the surprise in store when you meet up with this great beauty, so I'll save that and let you see for yourself. But I'll warn you about this. Madame Z is a toucher. She likes to feel you, your muscles, how hard and firm they are. Would you believe she put her hand directly on my fly to find out the size of what was underneath? No, I don't believe that. He laughed merrily and threw his arm about me. Oh, Kathy, what a life we're going to live, you and I. What heaven will be ours when you find out you've got sole property rights to the handsomest and most gifted and graceful danseur ever born? He drew me even closer and whispered in my ear, and I haven't said a word about the talented lover I am. I laughed too and shoved him away. If you aren't the most conceited, arrogant person I've ever met, and I suspect you can be quite ruthless too when it comes to getting what you want. Right on, he said with a following laugh. I'm all of that and more too, as you'll soon find out. After all, wasn't I ruthlessly determined to get you where I want you? Chapter 15 New York, New York It was snowing hell-bent when our plane landed in New York. The cold in my nostrils stunned me. I'd forgotten bitter winters like this. The wind howling down those narrow canyonways seemed to want to rip the skin from my face. Ice seemed to enter my lungs and shrivel them with constricting pain. I gasped, laughed, turned to glance at Julian, who was paying the cab driver, and then I pulled from my coat pocket a red-knitted scarf Henny had made for me. Julian took it and helped me swathe it about my head and neck so it half covered my face. Then I shocked him by pulling from the other pocket a red scarf I had knitted for him. "'Gosh, thanks. I never thought you cared.' He seemed very pleased as he wrapped his neck and ears. On this day of days the cold had made his cheeks as red as his lips, and with that blue-black hair that curled just above his coat collar and those sparkling dark eyes, the sheer beauty of him was enough to steal anyone's breath. "'Okay,' he said. "'Pull yourself together and prepare to meet ballet personified, my sweet delicious dance instructor whom you will positively adore. Just to be here had me on edge, so I clung as close as possible to Julian, staring at all the people who dared to brave such ferocious weather. The luggage we'd brought was left in a waiting room of the huge building, and in the flurry of scurrying after Julian, I didn't notice much of anything until we were in the office of our ballet mistress, Madame Zolta Korovenskov. Her stance, her arrogance immediately reminded me of Madame Marisha, but this woman was much older, if all those wrinkles could be counted as tree rings to indicate her age. Queenly stiff, she rose from behind a desk that was impressively wide. Coolly, all business, she stalked over to us and looked us over with bead-black eyes as small as those of a mouse. What hair she had was skinned back from her dry, brittle face like fine white floss, she wasn't five feet tall, but radiated six feet of authority. Her half-moon glasses perched precariously on the end of an astonishingly long, thin nose. Above those half-discs, she peered at us, squinting, though her minute eyes almost disappeared in the crow's feet. Julian was so unlucky as to gain her scrutiny first. Her puckered little prune mouth drew up like a drawstring purse. I watched and waited for a smile to come and break her parchment skin. I expected her voice to crackle, cackle, witch-like. So, she spat at Julian, you take off when you want and come back when you want, and you expect me to say I'm glad to see you. Bah! Do that one more time and out you go. Who is this girl with you? Julian gave the old hag a charming smile and quickly put his arm about her. Madame Zolta Korovenskov, may I introduce you to Miss Catherine Dahl, the wonderful dancer I've been telling you about for months and months, and she is the reason why I left without your permission. She looked me over with very interested, gimlet eyes. You come from some nowhere, too? she whiplashed. You've got the look of another place, 
like my black devil here does. He's a very good dancer, but not as good as he thinks. Can I believe him about you? I guess, madam, you'll just have to watch me dance and judge for yourself. Can you dance? As I said before, madam, wait and judge for yourself. See, madam, Julian said eagerly, Cathy's got spirit, fire. You should see her whip her leg doing fuetes. She's so fast she's a blur. Ha! she snorted, then came to encircle me, and next she gave my face such a close scrutiny I was blushing. She felt my arms, my chest, even my breasts, then put her bony hands on my neck and felt the cords. Those audacious hands roamed down the length of my body, while I wanted to scream out I wasn't a slave to be sold in the marketplace. I was grateful she didn't put her hand on my crotch as she'd done to Julian. I stood still and endured the inspection, and felt all the while a deep, hot blush. She looked up to see it and smiled sarcastically. When she'd done, and I'd been physically appraised and evaluated, she delved the depths of my eyes to drink up my essence. I felt she was trying to absorb my youth with her eyes and drain it from me. Then she was touching my hair. "'When do you plan to marry?' she shot out. "'Sometime when I'm near thirty, maybe, or maybe never,' I answered uneasily. "'But most certainly I'm going to wait until after I'm rich and famous and the world's best prima ballerina.' "'Ha!' Huh? "'You have many illusions about yourself. "'Beautiful faces don't usually go with great dancers. "'Beauty thinks it needs no talent and can feed on itself, so it soon dies. "'Look at me. Once I was young and a great beauty. "'What do you see now?' "'She was hideous, and she couldn't have ever been beautiful, "'or there'd be some evidence. "'As if sensing my doubt to her claim, "'she gestured arrogantly to all the photographs on the walls,' on her desk, on the tables, bookshelves, all showed the same lovely young ballerina. Me, she proudly informed. I couldn't believe it. They were old photos, brownish in colour, the costumes outdated, and yet she had been lovely. She gave me a wide, amused smile, patted my shoulder and said, Good. Age comes to everyone and makes everyone equal. Who did you study with before Marisha Rosenkoff? Miss Denise Danielle. I hesitated, fearful of telling her about all the years I danced alone and been my own instructor. Ah, she sighed, looking very sad. I saw Denise Danielle dance many times, such a brilliant performer, but she made the old mistake and fell in love. End of promising career. Now all she do is teach. Her voice rose and fell, quivering, gaining strength, then losing it. She pronounced love with a long U, making the word sound foreign and silly. Big Head Julian says you are a great dancer, but I have to see you dance before I believe, and then I will decide if beauty is its own excuse for being. Once more she sighed. You drink? No. Why is your skin so pale? Do you never go in sun? Too much sun burns me. Ah, you and your lover boy, afraid of the sun. Julian is not my lover, I said between clenched teeth, shooting him a fierce look, for he must have told her we were. Not an element of our expressions missed the keen observation of those ebony bead eyes. Julian, did you or did you not tell me you were in love with this girl? He flushed and lowered his eyes, and had the decency to look embarrassed for once. Madame, the love is all on my side, I'm ashamed to admit. Cathy feels nothing for me. But she will, sooner or later. Fine, the old witch said with a bird-like nod. You have a big passion for her, she has none for you. That makes for sizzling sensational dancing on your part. Our box office will overflow. I see it coming. That was, of course, the reason she took me on, knowing Julian had his unsatisfied lust, and knowing I had a smouldering desire to find someone else off stage. On stage he was everything, beautiful, romantic and sensual, my dream lover. If we could have danced through all our days and nights, we could have set the world on fire. As it was, when he was only himself, with his glib and often smutty tongue, I ran from him. 
I went to bed each night thinking of Paul, prowling his lonely gardens, and refused to let myself dream of Chris. I was soon ensconced in a small apartment twelve blocks from the dance studio. Two other dancers shared the three small rooms and one tiny bath with me. Two floors above, Julian shared an apartment with two male dancers in rooms no bigger than those we three girls had. His roommates were Alexis Tarrell and Michael Michel, both in their early twenties, and both just as determined as Julian to become the best male danseur of their generation. I was astonished to find out Madame Zolta considered Alexis the best, and Michael next, and Julian third. I soon found out why she held him back. He had no respect for her authority. He wanted to do everything in his own way, and because of this she punished him. My roommates were as different as night and day. Yolanda Lang was half British, half Arab, and the strange combination made for one of the most exotic, dark-haired, slow-eyed beauties I'd ever seen. She was tall for a dancer, five-eight, the same height as my mother. Her breasts, when I saw them, were small, hard lumps, all large, dark nipples. But she wasn't ashamed of their size. She delighted in walking about naked, showing off. And soon I found out her breasts mirrored her personality, small, hard, and mean. Yolanda wanted what she wanted when she wanted it, and she'd do anything to get it. She asked me a thousand questions in less than an hour, and in that same hour told me her life story. Her father was a British diplomat who'd married a belly dancer. She'd lived everywhere, done everything. I immediately disliked Yolanda Lang. April Summers was from Kansas City, Missouri. She had soft brown hair, blue-green eyes. We were both the same height, five feet four and a half inches. She was shy, and seldom did she raise her voice above a whisper. When loud, raucous Yolanda was around, April seemed to have no voice at all. Yolanda liked noise. At all times, the record player or the television had to be turned on. April spoke of her family with love, respect, and pride. While Yolanda professed hatred for parents who'd pushed her into boarding schools and left her alone on holidays, April and I became fast friends before our first day together was over. She was eighteen and pretty enough to please any man. But for some strange reason, the boys of the academy didn't pay April one whit of attention. It was Yolanda who made them hot and panting, and soon enough I learned why. She was the one who gave out. As for me, the boys saw me. They asked for dates, but Julian made it clear I wasn't available. I was his. He told everyone we were lovers. Though I persistently denied this, he would tell them in private I was old-fashioned and ashamed to admit we were living in sin. He chidingly explained in my very presence, "It's that old Southern belle tradition. Cows down south like guys to think they're sweet, shy, demure, but underneath that cool magnolia exterior, sex pots, every one. Of course they believed him and not me. Why should they believe the truth when a lie was so much more exciting?" I was happy enough, though. I adapted to New York as one native-born, rushing about as every New Yorker had to. Get there fast. Don't waste a second. There was so much to prove before someone else with a pretty face and more talent showed up to knock you off the board. But while I was ahead in the game, it was wild and heady stuff, exhausting and demanding. How grateful I was that Paul kept sending me a weekly check for what I earned at the dance company wouldn't have paid for my cosmetics. The three of us who shared rooms four one six required at least ten hours of sleep. We got up at dawn to limber up at our home bar before breakfast. Breakfast had to be very light, as was lunch. Only during the last meal of the day, after a performance, could we really satisfy our ravenous appetites. It seemed I was always hungry, but I never had enough to eat. In just one performance in the corps de ballet, I lost five or six pounds. Julian was with me constantly, shadowing me too closely, keeping me from dating anyone else. Depending on my mood or state of exhaustion, I was resentful of this, and other times happy to have someone around who wasn't a stranger. Madame Zolta said one day in June, "Your name is silly. Change it, Catherine Doll. What kind of name for dancer? 
an inane, unexciting name. It doesn't suit you at all. Now you wait a minute, madame, I snapped back, abandoning my attitude position. I chose that name when I was seven, and my father liked it. He thought it suited me fine, so I'm going to use it, stupid or not. I longed to tell her Madame Navarena Zolta Korovenska wasn't exactly what I'd call a lyrical name either. Don't argue with me, girl. Change it. She used her ivory walking cane to pound on the floor. But if I changed my name, how would my mother know when I reached the top? She had to know. Still, that wretched little witch in her outdated silly costume could narrow her fierce dark eyes and lift that cane and brandish it so I was forced to yield or else. Julian slouched nearby and grinned. I agreed I would change the spelling of my last name from Doll to Dahl, D-A-H-L. That is better, she said sourly. Some bot. Madame Z rode my back. She nagged, she criticised, she complained if I was innovative and complained when I wasn't. She didn't like the way I wore my hair and said I had too much. Cut it off, she ordered. But I refused to snip off even an inch, for I believed my long hair a great asset for the role of sleeping beauty. She snorted when I said this. Snorting was one of her favourite means of expression. If she hadn't been a wonderfully gifted instructor, we'd have all hated her. Her very doer nature forced the best from us, but we so wanted to see her smile. She was also a choreographer, but we had another two who came and went and supervised when he wasn't in Hollywood, in Europe, or off in some remote spot dreaming up new dancing scores. One afternoon after class, when we dancers were playing about foolishly, I jumped up to dance wildly to a popular song. Madame came in and caught me, then exploded, we dance classically here. No modern dance here. Her dry, wrinkled face screwed into a dried headhunter's belt ornament. You, Dahl, explain the difference between classical and modern. Julian winked at me, then fell backward to rest on his elbows and cross an elegant ankle over a knee as he delighted in my discomfort. Succinctly, madame, I began with my mother's poise. The modern form of ballet consists mostly of groveling about on the floor and posturing, while classical stands up on its toes, whirls, spins, and is never too seductive or awkward, and it tells a story. How right you are, she said icily. Now get you home to bed and posture and grovel there if you feel the need to express yourself in such a manner. Never let me catch you doing such before my eyes again. Modern and classical could be blended and made beautiful. The tightness of that small shrew enraged me, and I screamed back, I hate you, madame. I despise your ratty old grey costumes that should have been thrown away thirty years ago. I hate your face, your voice, your walk, and your talk. Find yourself another dancer. I'm going home. I flounced off toward the dressing room, leaving all the dancers standing in shock, staring after me. I ripped off my practice clothes and yanked on underwear. Into the dressing room stalked the grim-faced witch, her eyes mean, her lips pressed tightly together. If you go home, you never come back. I don't want to come back. You will wither away and die. You're a fool if you think that, I snapped without regard to her age or respect for her talent. I can live my life without dancing, and happily too. So go to hell, Madame Zolta. As if a spell had been broken, that old hag smiled at me, and sweetly, too. Ah, you have spirit. I was wondering if you did. Tell me to go to hell. It is nice to hear. Hell is better than heaven, anyway. Now, seriously, Catherine, she said in a kind tone, kinder than I'd ever heard from her, you are a wonderfully gifted dancer, the best I have. But you are so impulsive, you abandon the classical and toss in whatever comes to your mind. I only try to teach you. Invent all you want, but keep it classical, elegant, beautiful. Tears glistened her eyes. You are my delight, did you know? I think you are the daughter I never had. You take me back to when I was young and thought all life was one big romantic adventure. I'm so afraid life will steal your look of enchantment, your childish wonderment. If you can hang on to that expression, you'll soon have the world at your feet. 
It was my attic face she was speaking of, that enchanted expression that used to so enthrall Chris. I'm sorry, madame, I said humbly. I was rude. I was wrong to scream, but you pick on me all the time, and I'm tired, homesick, too. I know, I know, she crooned as she came to embrace me, then rocked with me back and forth. To be young and in a strange city is hard on the nerves and confidence. But remember, I only needed to know what you are made of. A dancer without fire is no dancer at all. I'd been living in New York seven months, working even on the weekends until I fell into bed dead tired before Madame Zolter thought I should be given a chance to dance a lead role with Julian to partner me. It was Madame's rule to alternate lead roles so that there would be no stars in her company, and though she'd hinted many times she wanted me for Clara in the Nutcracker, I thought she'd just use that to dangle before me like a rich plum I'd never be allowed to eat. Then it became a reality. Our company was in competition with much larger and better-known companies, so it was an absolute stroke of genius that she was able to sell a television producer on the notion that people who couldn't afford to buy ballet tickets could be reached by television. I called Paul long distance to tell him my great news. Paul, I'm going to appear on TV in the Nutcracker. I'll be Clara. He laughed and congratulated me. I guess that means you won't be coming home this summer, he said rather sadly. Carrie misses you an awful lot, Kathy. You've only paid us one short visit since you went away. I'm sorry. I want to come, but I need this chance to star, Paul. Please explain to Carrie so her feelings won't be hurt. Is she there? No. She's finally made a friend and is sleeping over. But call again tomorrow night and reverse the charges and tell her yourself. And Chris? How is he? I asked. Fine, fine. He gets nothing but A's. And if he can manage to keep that up, he'll be accepted for an accelerated program and can finish out his fourth year of college while starting his first year in medical school. Simultaneously, I asked, marveling that anyone, even Chris, could be that smart and accomplish so much. Sure, it can be done. Paul, what about you? Are you well? Are you working too much, too many long hours? I'm healthy, and yes, I do work long hours, as every doctor does. And since you can't come to visit us, I think it would be nice for Carrie if we came to visit you. Oh, that was the best idea I'd heard in months and months. And bring Chris, I said. He'd love to meet all the pretty ballerinas I can introduce him to. But you, Paul, you'd better not look at anyone but me. He made a strange sound in his throat before he chuckled. Don't worry, Catherine, there's not a day that passes that I don't see your face before me. In early August, the television production of The Nutcracker was taped for Christmas time release. Julian and I sat close together and watched the rushes, and when it was over he turned to take me in his arms, and for the first time he told me with the kind of sincerity I could believe, I love you, Cathy. Please stop taking me so lightly. Hardly had we rested up from the nutcracker when Yolly fell and sprained her ankle, and April was visiting her parents, so I had the chance to be Sleeping Beauty. Since Julian had played two roles in the TV production, both Alexis and Michael thought it should be their turn to partner me. Madame Zolta frowned, then looked at Julian, then at me. Alexis, Michael, I promise you the very next lead roles. But let Julian dance with Catherine. They have a rare magic between them that is spellbinding. I want to see how they do in a really lavish production like The Sleeping Beauty. Oh, the thoughts I had on stage as I lay so still on the purple velvet couch, waiting for my lover to come and put on my lips an arousing, come-alive kiss. The glorious music made me feel more real on that couch than when I was just me with no royal blood at all. I felt enchanted, surrounded by an aura of beauty, as I quietly, gracefully lay with my arms folded on my breasts, and my heart pulsated in rhythm with the glorious music. Out in the dark audience, Paul, Chris, and Carrie and Henny were watching for the first time a New York performance. 
Truly, I felt in my bones I was that mystical medieval princess. I saw him dreamily from beneath almost closed eyes, my prince. He danced about me. Then, down on one knee, he knelt to tenderly gaze upon my face before he dared to put a hesitant kiss upon my closed lips. I awakened, shy, disoriented, fluttering my eyelids. I feigned love on sight, but was so frightened, so maidenly virtuous, he had to woo me with more dancing and coax me to dance too, and in the most passionate pas de deux I soon succumbed to his charms, and in conquest he lifted me high and up on the flat of his palm that knew well the exact spot to balance my weight just right, and I was carried off stage. The last act ended, the applause thundered and resounded, as time and again the curtain rose and came down. Julian and I took eight curtain calls of our very own. Red roses were thrust again and again into my arms, and flowers were tossed onto the stage. I looked down to see one single yellow buttercup, weighted down by a folded slip of paper. I bent to pick it up and knew it was from Chris, even before I had the chance to read his note. Daddy's four yellow buttercups, and here was one put in a freezer to keep it fresh until it could be thrown to me as a tribute to what we used to be. Blindly I stared out into an audience of blurred faces, searching to see those I loved. All I could see was the attic, the gloomy, awesomely huge attic with its paper flowers, and over there near the stairwell was Chris, standing in the shadows, near the shrouded sofa and the big trunk, and his yearning desire was on his face as he watched me dance on and on. I was crying, and the audience loved it. They gave me a standing ovation. I turned to hand a red rose to Julian, and again they thundered their applause. And he kissed me, right in front of thousands. He dared to kiss me, and it wasn't respectful, it was possessive. Damn you for doing that, I hissed, feeling humiliated. Damn you for not wanting me, he hissed back. I'm not yours. You will be. My family came backstage to lavish me with praise. Chris had grown taller, but Carrie was very much the same, maybe a bit taller, not much. I kissed Henny's firm round cheek. Only then could I look at Paul. Our eyes locked and held. Did he still love me, want me, need me? He hadn't answered my last letter. Easily hurt, I'd written only to Carrie to tell her of the upcoming performances, and only then did Paul call to say he was bringing my family to New York. After the performance came the buffet party given for us by the rich patrons Madame Z cultivated. Wear the costumes you have on, she instructed. The aficionados get a big thrill seeing dancers up close in costumes. But take off the stage makeup. Use what you wear every day to look stunning. Never for one second give the public the idea you are less than glamorous. Music was playing and Chris took me into his arms for a waltz the dance I had taught him so many years ago. This is still the way you dance, I chided. He grinned in a self-effacing way. Can't help it if you got all the dancing talent and I got all the brains. Remarks like that could easily make me think you have no brains. He laughed again and I was drawn closer. Besides, I don't have to dance and posture to win over the girls. Just take a look at your friend Yolanda. She's quite a beauty, and she's been giving me the eye all evening. She gives every good-looking guy the eye, so don't feel so flattered. She'll sleep with you tonight, if you want that, and tomorrow night with someone else. Are you like her, too? he shot back, narrowing his eyes. I smiled at him wickedly, thinking, No, I was like Mama, sweet and cool and able to handle men. At least I was learning. To prove this, I winked at Paul, seeing if he'd come over and cut in. Swiftly, Paul was on his feet, moving gracefully across the dance floor to take me from Chris. My brother's lips tightened, then he strolled straight from me to Yolanda. In a minute or two, they disappeared. "'I guess you think I'm all hands and clumsy feet after dancing with Julian,' said Paul, who could dance better than Chris." Even when the music changed into a faster rhythm with a jungle beat, he followed along, surprising me that he could let go of his dignity and jiggle around, almost as abandoned as a college kid. <laughs> Paul, you're wonderful. He laughed and said I made him feel young again. 
It was so much fun to see him like this, relaxed, that I went a bit wild with my dancing. Carrie and Henny looked tired and ill at ease. I'm sleepy, complained Carrie, rubbing her eyes. Can't we go to bed now? It was twelve o'clock when we dropped Henny and Carrie off at their hotel. Then Paul and I sat in a quiet Italian cafe and looked at one another. He still wore the moustache, not a neat dandy one, but a thick brush above his sensual lips. He'd gained a few pounds, but it didn't detract from his looks or his appeal. He reached across the table to gather both my hands in his, then lifted them to his face so he could rub his cheek against them. And all the while he did this, his eyes asked a burning question, forcing a question from me. Paul, have you found someone else? Have you? I asked first. I'm not looking for anyone else. It was an answer to make my heartbeats quicken, for it had been so long, and I loved him too much. I watched him pay the check, pick up my coat and hold it, and then his own for me to hold. Our eyes met, and then we almost ran from the restaurant to the nearest hotel, where he registered us as Mr. and Mrs. Paul Sheffield. In a room painted dark red, he took off my clothes with such seductive slowness, I was ready even before he went down on his knees to kiss me everywhere. Then he held me close, caressed and cherished me, kissed and pleasured until we were again made one. After we were spent, he traced his finger along my lips, looking at me so tenderly. Catherine, what I wrote on that hotel register I meant, he said, kissing me softly. I stared at him, disbelieving. Paul, don't tease me. I'm not teasing, Catherine. I've missed you so much since you've been away. I realized what a fool I've been to deny you and myself the chance to find happiness. Life is too short to have so many doubts. Now you're finding success in New York. I want to share it with you. I don't want us to have to sneak around behind Chris's back. I don't want to have to worry about the small-town gossips. I want to be with you. I want you forever. I want you to be my wife. Oh, Paul, I cried, throwing my arms about his neck. I love you forever, I promise. My eyes filled with tears. I was so relieved he'd asked me to marry him at last. I'll make you the best wife any man has ever known. I meant it, too. We didn't sleep that night. We stayed awake, planning how it would be when we were married. I would stay with the company. Somehow we'd work it out. The only shadow that darkened our joy was Chris. How would we tell Chris? We decided to wait until Christmas, when I would be in Claremont. Until then I had to keep my happiness a secret, hide it from the world, so no one would guess I was about to become Mrs. Paul Scott Sheffield. Chapter 16 A Fighting Chance That was the autumn of my happiness, of my burgeoning success, of my love for Paul. I thought I had fate fully under my control. I dared it to stop me, for I was free and running true on my course. Almost on top now, I had nothing to fear now, nothing at all. I couldn't wait to tell the world about my engagement to Paul. But stealthily, I protected my secret. I told no one, not Julian nor Madame Zolta, for there was much at stake, and I had to bide my time to make sure everything would continue to go my way. Right now I still needed Julian to partner me just as much as he needed me, and I needed Madame Zolta to have complete confidence in me. If she knew I was going to be married, something she did not highly approve of, she might not give me all the lead roles. She might think I was a lost cause and not worth her time. And I still had to be famous. I still had to show Mama how much better I was than she. Now that Julian and I were achieving a little recognition, Madame Zolta began to pay us more money. Julian came running to me one Saturday morning, terribly excited, as he grabbed me up and swung me off my feet in a circle. Guess what? The old witch said I could buy her Cadillac on a time payment plan. It's only two and a half years old, Kathy. He looked wistful. Of course, I always hoped my first Cadillac would be a brand new one. 
But when a certain ballet mistress is scared to death a certain sensational danseur might join another ballet company and take along with him her best ballerina, how can that certain someone refuse to almost give away her Cadillac? Blackmail, I cried. He laughed and grabbed my hand and we dashed to look at his new car parked outside our apartment building. My breath pulled in, it looked so new. Oh, Julian, I love it! You couldn't blackmail her if she didn't want you to have one of her pets. She knows you will pamper it, and don't ever, ever sell it. Oh, Kathy, his eyes shone brilliantly with unused tears. Can't you see why I love you so? We're alike. Why can't you love me just a little? Proudly, he swung open the door to give me the rare privilege of being the first girl to ride in his first Cadillac. We had a wild and crazy kind of day from there on. We drove through Central Park and all the way up through Harlem to the George Washington Bridge and back. It was raining, but I didn't mind. It was warm and cozy in the car. Then Julian started in again. Kathy, you're never going to love me, are you? It was a question he put to me at least once or twice a day in one form or another. I longed to tell him of my engagement to Paul, to put an end to his questions once and for all, but I steadfastly kept my secret. It's because you're still a virgin, isn't it? I'll be so gentle, so tender, Kathy. Give me a chance, please. Good God, Julian, is that all you ever have on your mind? Yeah, he snarled. You're damn right it is. And I'm sick and tired of the game you play with me. He guided the car out into a heavy stream of traffic. You're a cock-teaser. You lead me on while we dance, then kick me in the groin when we're not. Take me home, Julian. I find that kind of talk disgusting. Right. You bet I'll take you home. He spat at me as I crouched near the passenger door he had locked. He shot me a fierce, distraught look, then bore down hard on the gas pedal. We sped down all those rain-slick streets, and every so often he'd glance my way to see how I was enjoying the terrifying ride. He laughed, wild and crazy, then braked so fast I was flung forward, so my forehead struck the windshield. Blood trickled from the cut. Next he snatched the purse from my lap, leaned to unlock my door, then he shoved me out into the pouring rain. "'To hell with you, Catherine Dahl!' he shouted, as I stood there in the rain, refusing to beg. "'My coat pockets were empty, no money. "'You've had your first and your last ride in my car. "'I hope you know your way around.' "'He saluted me with an evil smile. "'Get home the best way you can, Puritan saint,' he spat out. "'If you can.' "'He drove off, leaving me on the street corner in the downpour in Brooklyn, "'where I'd never been before. "'I didn't even have a nickel. "'I couldn't make a phone call or use a subway.' and the rain came down strong. My lightweight coat was soaked through. I knew I was in an unsavory district where anything could happen, and he'd left me here when he'd sworn to take care of me. I began to walk, not knowing north from south, east from west, and then I saw a cab cruising by and hailed it. Nervously I leaned forward to watch the meter click away the miles and the dollars. Damn you again, Julian, for taking me so far. Finally, we reached my apartment building at the cost of fifteen dollars. What do you mean you ain't got it on you? The cab driver flared. I'll drive you straight to the police precinct. We bickered back and forth, with me trying to explain he couldn't be paid unless he let me out to go for money, and all the while the meter was running. Finally, he agreed. But you'd better be back, chicky, in five minutes or else. An English fox, chased by a hundred hounds, couldn't have run faster than I did. The elevator crawled upward, creaking all the way. Never did I step in that thing when I wasn't afraid it would stop between floors and I'd be trapped. Finally the door opened and I raced down the hall to bang on the door, praying April or Yolanda would be there to let me in. Crazy Julian had my handbag and my key. "'Take it easy,' bellowed Yolanda. "'I'm coming. Who is it, anyway?' Kathy, let me in quick. I've got a taxi driver waiting with his meter running. If you think you're going to put the bite on me, forget it, she said, swinging open the door. She wore only nylon briefs, and her freshly shampooed head was wrapped with a red towel. You look like something the sea coughed up, she said invitingly. 
I wasn't one to pay much attention to Yolanda. I shoved her aside, ran to where I hid my secret cache of emergency money. Then I went slack. The small key to my locked treasure chest was in the bag Julian had, if he hadn't thrown it away. Please, Yolly, loan me fifteen and a buck for a tip. Shrewdly, she looked me over while she removed the towel and began to comb her long, dark hair. What you got to trade for small favors like that? I'll give you anything you want. Just give me the money. Okay, you just keep your promise to repay. Slowly, she took a twenty from her fat billfold. Give the driver a fiver. That will cool him off. And anything I want, right? I agreed and raced off. No sooner did the driver grab the twenty than he was smiling, friendly as he tipped his cap. See you around, chicky. I hoped he'd drop dead. I was so chilled, the first thing I did was to run a tub of hot water, but only after I'd scrubbed off the dirty ring Yolly had left. My hair was still wet as I pulled on clothes, planning to go to Julian and demand my purse back when Yolly blocked my way. Come on, Kathy, I want you to keep your bargain. Anything I want, right? Right, I said disgustedly. What do you want? She smiled and leaned provocatively against a wall. Your brother. I want you to invite him up next weekend. Don't be ridiculous. Chris is in college. He can't come up here any time he wants. You get him up here any way you have to. Say you're sick, say you desperately need him, but get him up here. And then you can keep the twenty. I turned to stare at her with hostility. No, I've got the money to pay you back. I'm not going to let Chris get involved with the likes of you. Still wearing only the briefs, she smeared on scarlet lipstick without looking in a mirror. Kathy, love, your dear, precious brother is already involved with the likes of me. I don't believe you. You're not his type. No, she purred her eyes narrowing as she watched me finish dressing. Let me tell you something, dollface. There isn't a guy alive who doesn't go for my type, including your dear brother and your lover boy, Julian. You lie, I cried. Chris wouldn't touch you with a ten-foot pole. And as for Julian, I don't give a damn if he sleeps with ten whores like you. Suddenly her face flamed red. She stiffened and came at me with her hands raised and her fingers curled into claws with long red fingernails. Bitch, she snarled. Don't you dare call me a whore. I don't take pay for what I want to give out, and your brother likes what I give out. Go and ask him how many times he's... Shut up, I yelled, not letting her finish. I don't believe anything you say. He's too smart to do anything but use you for physical needs. Beyond that, you couldn't mean more than dirt to him. She grabbed me, and I belted her back hard, hard enough so she fell to the floor. You're nothing but a shallow, mean tramp, Yolanda Lang, I screamed with fury. Not nearly good enough for my brother to wipe his feet on. You've slept with every dancer in the company. I don't care what you do. Just leave me and leave my brother alone. Her nose was bleeding. Oh, I didn't know I'd hit that hard, and her nose was also beginning to swell. Quickly she jumped to her feet, but for some reason she backed off from me. Nobody talks to me like that and gets away with it. You're going to regret this day, Catherine Dahl. I'll get your brother. And what's more, I'll take Julian from you, too. And when he's mine, you'll find out that without him you're nothing. Nothing but a hick dancer Madame Z would throw out if Julian didn't insist on keeping you on because he's got the hots for a virgin. What she screamed out could be so true... Maybe she was right, that without Julian I wouldn't be anything special. I felt sick, and I hated her, hated her for soiling Chris and my image of him. I began to throw my clothes in my suitcases, and determined I'd go back to Claremont before I'd live another hour near Yolanda. Go on, she hissed between her clenched teeth. Run away, little prude. What a fool you are. I'm not a whore. It's just I'm not the tease you are, and between the two I choose my kind. Heedless of what she said, I finished packing, then strapped the handles of my three bags together so I could drag them out into the hall, and under my arm I carried a soft leather satchel stuffed full. I turned at the door to look back at Yolanda, who had sprawled on the bed like a sleek cat. You really do terrify me, Yolanda. 
I'm so scared I could laugh. I've faced up to bigger and better than you, and still I'm alive. So don't you come near me again, or it will be you who lives to regret this day. Shortly after I slammed the door, I was on Julian's floor. Dragging along my tied-together luggage, I banged on the door to Julian's apartment with both fists. Julian, I cried, if you're in there, open this door and give me back my purse. Open this door or you'll never have me for a dance partner again. He opened the door quickly enough, wearing nothing but a bath towel wrapped about his narrow hips. Before I knew what was happening, he dragged me into the room and threw me down on the bed. I looked around frantically, hoping to see Alexis or Michael, but it was my bad luck he had the apartment to himself. Sure, he barked, you can have your damn purse back after you answer a few questions. I jumped up from the bed and he shoved me down again, then knelt so he straddled my body, and in no way could I escape. You let me go, you beast, I yelled. I walked six blocks in the rain and was freezing cold. Now let me up and give me my purse. Why can't you love me, he shot out, holding me down with both hands as I struggled to free myself. Is it because you're in love with someone else? Who is it? It's that big doctor who took you in, isn't it? I shook my head, terribly afraid of him. I couldn't tell him the truth. He looked almost insane with jealousy. His hair was so wet from his recent shower he dripped water on me. Kathy, I've had about all I can take from you. It's been about three years since we met, and I'm not getting anywhere. It can't be me that's wrong, so it must be you. Who is it? Nobody, I lied. And you are all wrong for me. The only thing I like about you, Julian Marquette, is the way you dance. Blood flooded his face. You think I'm blind and stupid, don't you? he asked, so furious he could likely explode. But I'm not blind, I'm not stupid, and I've seen the way you look at that doctor, and so help me God if I haven't seen you look at your own brother in the same way. So don't go getting up on your high horse of morals, Catherine Dahl, for I've never seen a brother and sister so fascinated with each other before. I slapped him then. He slapped back twice as hard, I tried to fight him off, but he was like an eel as he wrestled me down to the floor, where I feared he'd soon rip off my clothes and rape me, but he didn't do that. He only held me beneath him and breathed heavily until he had some control of his raging emotions, and only then did he speak. You're mine, Kathy, whether you know it or not. You belong to me, and if any man comes between us, I'll kill him, and you too. So remember that before you turn your eyes on anyone but me. He gave me my purse then and told me to count my money to see if he'd stolen any. I had forty-two dollars and sixty-two cents. It was all there. Shakily, I gained my feet when he allowed me to, and I trembled as I backed to the door, opened it, and stepped out into the hall, clutching my purse tight. Only then did I dare to speak what I thought— there are institutions for madmen like you, Julian. You can't tell me whom to love, and you can't force me to love you. If you had deliberately set out to make yourself repugnant to me, you couldn't have done a better job of it. Now I can't even like you, and as for dancing together again, forget it. I slammed the door in his face, then hurried away. But as I reached the elevator, he had the door open again, and he cursed something so terrible I can't repeat it, except it ended with... Damn you to hell, Kathy. I've said it before and I'll say it again. And you'll wish to God you were in hell before I'm done with you. After that terrible scene with Yolanda, then Julian, I sought out Madame Zalter and told her I just couldn't live any longer in an apartment with a girl determined to ruin my career. She's afraid of you, Catherine, that's all. Yolanda was the superstar in my small company until you came along. Now she feels threatened. Make up with her. Be a good girl and go and say you're sorry for whatever it was. No, madame. I don't like her and I refuse to live in the same apartment with her. So if you don't give me more money, I'll have to go to another company and see if they will. And if they won't, then I'll go back to Claremont. She groaned, bowed her skeleton head into her bony hands and moaned some more. Oh, how grand Russians were at expressing emotions. Okay, you blackmail me and I give in. I'll give you a small raise and tell you where to find cheap apartment. 
but it won't be so nice as when you left. Ha! That had been nice. But she was right. The only apartment I could find would fit in Paul's smallest bedroom, all two rooms of it. But it was my own, the very first place I'd had all to myself, and for a few days I exulted in fixing it up as best I could. Then I really began to sleep restlessly, waking up every few minutes to listen to all the squeaks and squeals the old building made. I longed for Paul. I longed for Chris. I heard the wind blow, and there was no one in another bed three feet from mine to comfort me with soft words and sparkling blue eyes. Chris's eyes were in front of me as I got up and sat at my kitchen table to write a note to Mrs. Winslow. I sent her my first rave review, one with a sensational photo of Julian and me in the Sleeping Beauty, and I wrote at the bottom of my letter, "'It won't be long now, Mrs. Winslow.' think about that every night before you fall asleep. Remember somewhere I'm still alive and I'm thinking of you and planning. I even mailed off that letter in the middle of the night before I had the chance to reconsider and tear it up. I raced home, threw myself on my bed and sobbed. Oh, God, I was never going to be set free, never. And despite all my tears, I woke up again, thinking of how I could hurt her so she'd never be the same. Be happy now, Mama, for it won't be long. I bought six copies of all papers that had anything to say about me. Unfortunately, most often my name was coupled with Julian's. Paul and Chris were also favoured with my reviews. The others I kept for myself or Mama. I pictured how she'd look when she opened the envelope, though it was my fear she'd just pitch it in the trash can after she'd torn up the envelope with its contents unread. Not once did I call her mother or mama, but kept my salutations always formal and cold. There would come a day when she would see me face to face, and I would call her mother, and I would watch her pale, then shudder. One morning I was awakened by someone banging on my door, Kathy, let me in. I have terrific news. It was Julian's voice. Go away, I said sleepily, getting up and pulling on a robe before I stumbled over to make him stop pounding on the door. Stop that, I yelled. I haven't forgiven you. I never will. So stay out of my life. Let me in or I'll kick the door down, he bellowed. I unlocked the deadbolts and swung the door open a crack. Julian barged in to sweep me up in his arms and plant on my lips a long, hot kiss while I was half yawning. Madame Zolter, yesterday after you left, she broke the news. We're going on tour in London. Two weeks there. I've never been to London, Cathy, and Madame is so delighted they've taken official notice of us over there. Really? I asked, catching his excitement. Then I staggered off toward my minute kitchen. Coffee had to have coffee before I could think straight. God, are you always so disoriented in the morning, he asked, following me into the kitchen, where he straddled a chair backwards and leaned on his elbows to watch my every move. Wake up, Cathy. Forgive me, kiss me, be my friend again. Hate me all you want tomorrow, but love me this day. For I was born for this day. You too. Cathy, we're going to make it. I know we are. Madame Zolter's company was never noticed before we became a team. It isn't her success. It's ours. His modesty deserved a medal. You've eaten breakfast, I asked, and hoped. I had only two slices of bacon and wanted both for myself. Sure, I have. I grabbed a bite before I came over, but I can eat again. Naturally, he could eat again. He could always eat. And that's when it hit me. London! Our company going to London! I spun around, crying, Julian, what you said, you're not kidding? We're going over there, all of us? He jumped up. Yes, all of us. It's a big break, our chance to make it big. We'll make the world sit up and take notice, and you and I, we'll be the stars, because together we're the best, and you know it as well as I do. I shared my meal and listened to him rhapsodize on the long and fantastic career we had just ahead. We'd be rich, 
And when we grew older, we'd settle down and have a couple of kids and then teach ballet. I'd like that, wouldn't I? I hated to spoil his plans, but I had to say it. Julian, I don't love you, so we can never be married. We'll go to London and dance together, and I'll do my best. But I plan to marry someone else. I'm already engaged. I have been for a long time now. His long, glaring look of disbelief and pure hatred delivered and re-delivered a series of visual slaps on my face. You're lying, he screamed. I shook my head to deny it. God damn you to hell for leading me on, he raged, then hurled himself out of my apartment. I'd never led him on except when we were dancing, and that was my role to play. That was all, all there was between us. Chapter 17 Winter Dreams I was going home for Christmas. The unpleasantness with Julian was forgotten in my happy anticipation of seeing Paul and bringing with me such good news. Thank God I had Paul to escape to. And I wasn't going to let Julian take the joy from this Christmas, for this was the time Paul and I had agreed to announce our engagement. And the only person who could ruin my happiness now was Chris. At two o'clock in the morning, Chris and Paul met me at the airport. It was bitterly cold, even in South Carolina. It was Chris who reached me first to catch me up in his strong arms, and he tried to put a kiss on my lips, but I turned my face so his kiss landed on my cheek. Hail to the conquering ballerina, he cried, hugging me tight and looking at me with so much pride. Oh, Kathy, you are so beautiful. Each time I see you, you make my heart hurt. He made my heart hurt, too, to see him more handsome than even Daddy had been. Quickly I looked in another direction. I tore away from my brother's embrace and ran toward Paul, who stood and watched. He stretched out his hands to take mine in them. Careful, careful, warned his long look. Mustn't let our news escape too soon. That was our best Christmas ever, from beginning to end, or almost to the end. Carrie had grown half an inch. She sat on the floor on Christmas morning with her big blue eyes happy and glowing as she exclaimed over the red velvet dress I'd bought her, found after hours and hours of searching almost every shop in New York. She looked like a radiant small princess when she tried the dress on. I tried to picture Corey, seated cross-legged on the floor, looking at his gifts, too. It was impossible for me to leave the memory of him out of any happy occasion. Oh, many a time I'd glimpsed a small boy with blonde curls and blue eyes on the streets of New York, and I'd run to chase after, hoping by some miracle it would be him. And it never was. Never was. Chris put a small box into my hands. Inside was a tiny gold heart locket, and in the centre of the lid was a genuine diamond, a small one, but a diamond nevertheless. Paid for by my own hard-earned cash, he said, as he fastened the chain about my neck. Waiting on tables pays well when you give good service with a smile. Then, furtively, he slipped a folded note in my hand. An hour later, when I had the chance, I read a note that made me cry. To my lady Catherine... I give you gold with a diamond you can barely see, but the gem would be castle-sized if it expressed all I feel for thee. I give you gold because it endures and love like the eternal sea, only your brother, Christopher. I hadn't read that note when Paul gave me his gift, wrapped in gold foil and topped by a huge red satin bow. My hands trembled as I fumbled with the many layers of tissue, all while he watched expectantly. A grey fox coat. The kind of coat you really need for New York winters, he said, his eyes shining with all the warmth and love he felt. It's too much, I choked, but I love it, absolutely love it. He smiled, made happy so easily. Every time you wear it, it's essential you think of me. "'and it should keep you warm on those cold, foggy days in London, too. "'I told him it was the most beautiful coat I'd ever seen, "'though I felt uneasy. 
it brought back thoughts of Mamma, and her closet full of many furs, gained only because she had the heartless cruelty to lock us away, and thus gain a fortune and furs and jewellery and everything else money could buy. Chris jerked his head around to catch something on my face that must have betrayed my love for Paul. His brows drew together in a scowl before he shot a glance at Paul. Then he got up and left the room. Somewhere upstairs a door slammed violently. Paul pretended not to notice. Look over in the corner, Catherine. That's a gift for all of us to enjoy. I stared at the huge cabinet TV set that Carrie jumped up and ran to turn on. He bought it just so we could watch you dance in the Nutcracker in colour, Kathy. Now he won't let me touch it. It's only because it is the devil to tune in correctly, Paul apologised. Throughout the rest of Christmas Day I saw very little of Chris, except at mealtimes. He wore the bright blue sweater I'd knitted for him, and it did fit, and under it the shirt and tie I'd given him as well. But none of my gifts to him could equal that gold and diamond locket with a small poem that left my heart bleeding. I hated it that he kept caring so much, and yet, when I thought about it later, I would hate it more if he didn't. That evening we all settled down comfortably before the new colour TV. I curled up on the floor near Paul's leg as he sat in a chair with Carrie close at my side. Chris sat far away, deep in a mood that took him even farther away than the actual feet that separated us. So I didn't feel as happy as I should have as I watched the credits roll by on the colourful screen. A tape which had been made in August and only now was to be seen in hundreds of cities across the country. How beautiful the sets looked in colour. They hadn't appeared nearly so ethereal in reality. I gazed at myself as Clara. Did I really look like that? I forgot myself and leaned unconsciously against Paul's thigh, and I felt his fingers twine into my hair. And then I didn't know where I was except on stage, with Julian now transformed by magic from the ugly nutcracker into the handsome prince. When it was over, I came back to myself, and the first thing I thought of was my mother. God, let her be home this night, and let her have seen me. Let her know what she tried to kill. Let her hurt, cry, grieve, please, please. What can I say, Kathy? said Paul in an awed way. No dancer could have performed that role better than you did, and Julian was superb, too. Yeah, said Chris coldly, getting to his feet and coming to lift Carrie up in his arms. You both were sensational, but it sure wasn't the kiddie performance I remember seeing when I was a child. The two of you made it seem a romance. Really, Kathy, turn that guy off, and quickly. With those words, he strode from the room and up the stairs to tuck Carrie into bed. I think your brother is suspicious, said Paul mildly, not only of Julian, but also of me. All day he has treated me as a rival. He is not going to be happy when he hears our news. Because, like others, I wanted to put off what was unpleasant, I suggested we not tell him until the next day. Then, when I was curled up on Paul's lap and we had our arms wrapped about each other, we exchanged the kind of passionate kisses held back until now. I was aching for him. After we turned off all the lights, we stole up the back stairs, and with the zeal born of starvation made love on his bed. Later on we slept, then woke up to make love again. At dawn I kissed him once more, then slipped on a robe to sneak down the hall to my own room. To my utter dismay, just as I stepped from Paul's room into the hall, Chris opened his door and came out. Abruptly he jerked to a stop and stared at me with astonished, hurt eyes. I cringed backward, so ashamed I could cry. Neither of us said a word. His eyes were the first to break from the frozen stare that also stilled our limbs. He ran for the stairs, but halfway there he turned to throw me a look of outraged disgust. I wanted to die. I went in to look at Carrie, who was sound asleep with her red velvet dress clutched in her arms, and on my bed I lay trying to think of what to say to Chris to make it right between us again. 
Why did I feel in my heart I was betraying him? The day after Christmas was for returning the gifts you hated, didn't want, or those that didn't fit. I forced myself to approach Chris, who was in the garden, fiercely snipping at the rose bushes with hedge clippers. Chris, I need to talk to you and explain a few things. He exploded. Paul had no right to give you a fur coat. A gift like that makes you seem a kept woman. Kathy, give him back that coat. And most of all, stop what you are doing with him. First, I took the clippers from his hands before he ruined Paul's beloved roses. Chris, it isn't as bad as you believe. You see, Paul and I, well, we are planning to marry in the spring. We love each other, so it isn't wrong what we do together. It's not an affair to be forgotten tomorrow. He needs me, and I need him. I stepped closer when he turned his back to hide his expression. It's better this way for me and for you, too, I said softly. I encircled his waist and twisted about to stare up in his face. He seemed stunned, like a healthy man who learns suddenly he has a terminal illness, and all hope had fled from him. He's too old for you. I love him. So you love him. What about your career? Are you throwing away all those years of dreaming, of working? Are you going to break your word? You know we swore to each other to go after our goals and not let those lost years make a difference. Paul and I have discussed that. He understands. He thinks we can work it out. He thinks. What does a doctor know about the dancer's life? You'll never be with him. He'll be here. You'll be God knows where with men your own age. You don't owe him anything, Kathy. You don't. We'll pay him back every cent he spent on us. We'll give him the respect he deserves and the love. But you don't owe him your life. Don't I? I asked in a whisper, aching inside for Chris. I think I do owe him my life. You know how I felt when I came here. I thought no one could be trusted or depended on. I expected the worst to happen to us, and it would have too without him. And I don't love him just for what he's done. I love him because of who and what he is. Chris, you don't see him as I do. He whirled about, seizing the shears from my hands. And what about Julian? You're going to be married to Paul and dance with Julian? You know Julian is mad for you. It's all over in the way he looks at you, the way he touches you. I backed off, stricken. Chris wasn't talking just of Julian. I'm sorry if this has ruined your holiday, I said, but you'll find someone too. You love Paul, I know you do, and when you've thought about this, you'll know we are right for each other despite our age difference, despite everything. I went off, leaving Chris in the garden with the hedge clippers. Paul drove me to Green Glenna, while Carrie stayed home to enjoy the new colour TV set and all her new clothes and games. Paul chatted happily of the party he planned for all of us tonight at his favourite restaurant. I wish I could be selfish and leave Chris and Carrie at home, but I want them there when I put the ring on your finger. I fixed my eyes on the winter landscape rolling by, the trees bare, the grass brown, the pretty houses with decorations and outdoor lights turned on after dark. Now I was part of the show, no longer just a spectator locked away. And yet I felt so torn, so miserable. Kathy, you are seated beside the happiest man in the world. And back in his garden, I'd left a man just as miserable as I felt. In my purse, I had a ring I'd bought for Carrie in New York. A tiny ruby for a very small finger. And even so, it was too large for anything but her thumb. As I stood there in the better jewellery department of the best store in town, discussing just how the ring could be reduced in size without ruining the setting, I suddenly heard a very familiar voice, a sweet, husky, dulcet-toned voice. As in slow motion, I cautiously turned my head. Mama, standing right next to me. If she'd been alone, perhaps she would have seen me, but she was absorbed in chatting to her female companion, who was dressed just as elegantly as she was. I'd changed considerably since she saw me last. 
still, if she looked, she would have to know who I was. And the two of them were discussing the party they had attended last night. Really, Corinne, Elsie does carry the festive theme through to an outrageous extreme. All that red. Parties. Was that all she did, go to parties? My heart went pounding in foxtrot time. My spirits went limp, sagged out by disappointment. A party! I should have known. She never stayed at home and watched TV. She hadn't seen me. Oh, but I was angry. I turned to make her see me. A small standing mirror on the glass jewellery showcase reflected her profile and showed me how lovely she was still. A bit older looking, but striking nonetheless. Her flaxen hair was drawn back to emphasise the perfection of her small gem of a nose, her pouting red lips, her long and naturally dark lashes that were made thicker by mascara. Her ears glittered with gold and diamonds, the real thing, and she was speaking. "'Can't you show me something just right for a lovely young girl?' she asked the sales lady. "'Something in good taste, not gaudy or too large, but something a young girl can keep all her life and be proud of. Who? What girl did she have to give gifts to? I felt jealous and watched her select a lovely gold locket, very much like the one Chris had given me. Three hundred dollars. Now our dear mother was spending money on a girl not her own, forgetting about us. Didn't she think of us, wonder how we were faring? How could she sleep at night when the world could be so cold, ugly, and cruel to children on their own? As far as I could tell, she was completely without guilt or regrets. Maybe that was what millions could do, nail a satisfied smirk to one's face, despite what it covered. I wanted to speak and see her poise collapse. I wanted her smiles to peel off like bark from a tree, and she'd be revealed before her friend for what she was, a monster without a heart, a killer, a fraud. But I said nothing. Kathy, said Paul, coming up behind me and putting his hands on my shoulders. I've returned everything. How about you? Ready to go now? I wanted desperately for my mother to see me with Paul, a man every bit as handsome as her darling Bart. I wanted to shout it out. See, I too can attract intelligent, kind, educated and handsome men. So quickly I glanced to see if Mama had heard Paul speak my name, hoping to delight in her stunned surprise, her guilt, her shame. But she'd moved on farther down the counter, and if she heard the name Kathy, it didn't cause her to turn her head. For some reason I didn't understand, I sobbed. "'Are you all right, darling?' asked Paul. He saw something on my face that puzzled him and put concern in his eyes. "'You're not having second thoughts about us, are you?' "'No, of course not,' I denied. "'But I was having second thoughts about me. "'Why hadn't I done something? "'Why hadn't I put out my foot this time and tripped her? "'Then I could have seen her sprawled on the floor, her poise vanished. "'Maybe. "'It would be like her to fall gracefully "'and have all the men in the store hurry to assist her up.' even Paul. I was dressing for the big affair at the plantation house when Chris came into my bedroom and sent Carrie away. Go watch TV, he said with more sharpness than I'd ever heard him use with her. I want to speak to your sister. Carrie threw him, then me, an odd look before she skipped out of the room. No sooner had Carrie closed the door behind her than Chris was at my side and seizing my shoulders. He shook me violently. "'Are you going through with this farce? "'You don't love him. "'You still love me. "'I know you do. "'Kathy, please don't do this to me. "'I know you're trying to set me free by marrying Paul, "'but that's not a good reason for marrying a man.' "'He hung his head, released my shoulders, "'and looked terribly ashamed. "'His voice came so low I had to keen my ears to hear his words. "'I know it's wrong what I feel for you. "'I know I should try and find someone else like you try to do, "'but... I can't stop loving you and wanting you. I think about you all during my days, every day. I dream about you at night. I want to wake up and see you in the room with me. I want to go to bed and know you're there, very close, where I can see you, touch you. A sob tore from his throat before he could go on. I can't bear to think of you with another man. Damn it, Kathy, I want you. 
You don't plan to have children anyway, so why can't it be me? I'd drawn away when he released my shoulders. When his words stopped, I ran to fling my arms about him as he clutched at me, as if I were the one and only woman who could save him from drowning. And we'd both drown if I did as he wanted. Oh, Chris, what can I say? Mama and Daddy made their mistake in marrying each other, and we were the ones to pay the price. We can't risk repeating their mistake. Yes, we can, he fervently cried. We don't have to have a sexual relationship. We can just live together, be together, just brother and sister with Carrie, too. Please, please, I beg you not to marry Paul. Shut up, I screamed. Leave me alone. I struck at him then, wanting to hurt him as every word he said hurt me. You make me feel so guilty, so ashamed. Chris, I did the best I could for you when we were prisoners. Maybe we did turn to each other, but only because we had no others. If there had been, you would never have wanted me, and I would never have given you a second glance. You are only a brother to me, Chris, and I want to keep you where you should be, which isn't in my bed. Then he had me in his arms, and I couldn't help but cling to him, with my cheek pressed against his thudding heart. He was having a hard time controlling his tears. I wanted him to forget, but every second he held me hard against him raised his hopes, and he was aroused. And he was the one who thought we could live platonically together. Let me go, Chris. If you love me for the rest of your life, keep it to yourself. I never want to hear about it again. I love Paul, and nothing you say will keep me from marrying him. You're lying to yourself, he choked holding me tighter. I see you watching me before you turn your eyes his way. You want me and you want him. You want everyone and everything. Don't ruin Paul's life when already he's suffered enough. He's too old for you, and age does count. You'll be old and dried up sexually when you're at your peak. Why, even Julian would be better. You are one big fool if you believe that. Then I'm a fool. I've always been a fool, haven't I? When I put my love and trust in you, that was the biggest mistake of my life, wasn't it? You are just as heartless in your own way as our mother. You want every man who appeals to you, regardless of the consequences. But I would let you have whomever you wanted, as long as you always came back to me. Christopher, you're jealous because I found someone to love before you did. And don't stand there and glare your icy blue eyes at me, for you've had plenty of affairs. I know you've slept with Yolanda Lang and God knows how many others. And what did you tell them? You told them you loved them too. Well, I don't love you now. I love Paul. And there's not one thing you can do to stop us from marrying each other. He stood there, pale-faced and quivering all over. And then he said in a hoarse whisper, Yes, there is. I could tell him about us. He wouldn't want you then. You wouldn't tell him that. You're much too honorable... And besides, he already knows. For long, long moments, we glared at each other. And then he ran from the room, slamming the door so hard behind him it put a long crack in the ceiling plaster. Only Carrie accompanied Paul and me to the plantation house. It's too bad Chris doesn't feel well. I hope he doesn't have the flu. Everyone else does. I didn't say anything just sat and listened to Carrie chatter on and on about how much she loved Christmas and the way it made everything ordinary look so pretty. Paul slipped a two-carat diamond ring on my finger while a huge fire crackled a yule log and soft music played. I did my best to make it a joyous occasion, laughing, smiling, exchanging long romantic looks while we sipped champagne and toasted each other and our long and happy future together. I danced with him under the giant crystal chandeliers and kept my eyes closed, picturing Chris home alone, sulking in his room and hating me. We're going to be so happy, Paul, I whispered, standing on the toes of my high-heeled silver slippers. Yes, this was the way our life together would be, easy, sweet, effortless, just like the lilting old-fashioned waltz we danced to. Because when you truly loved, there were no problems that love couldn't overcome. Me and my ideas. Chapter 18 April's Fool Drive, dedication, 
desire, determination. The four Ds of the ballet world we had to live by. If Madame Z had been tough on us before Christmas, now she clamped down on us such a heavy schedule of practice, all we did was work. She lectured on how perfect the royal ballet was, strictly classical, but we were to do everything in our own unique American way, classical, but more beautiful and innovative. Julian was absolutely ruthless, even demonic. I began to really despise him. We were both wet with sweat, and our hair hung in strings. My leotard was glued to my skin. Julian wore only a loincloth. He yelled as if I were deaf. Do it right this time, damn it! I don't want to be here all night. Stop yelling at me, Julian. I can hear perfectly well. Then do it right. First take three steps, and then you kick, then jump for me to catch. And for God's sake, this time lay back immediately. Don't stay upright and stiff. The moment I catch you, fall backwards and go limp. If you can manage to do anything right or graceful today. That was my trouble. I didn't trust him now. I was afraid he was going to try to hurt me. Julian, you yell at me as if I'm deliberately doing everything wrong. It seems to me you are. If you really wanted to do it right, you could. All you have to do is take three steps, kick, then jump, and I lift and you fall back. Now see if you can get it right at least one time out of fifty tries. Do you think I like this? Look at my armpits, I said as I lifted my arms to show him. See how raw they are, how you rub the skin off? And tomorrow I'll be black and blue all over from the bruises you make with your hard grasps. Then do it right. He raged not only with his voice but with his jet eyes, and I was terribly afraid he was just waiting for the opportunity to let me fall on purpose for revenge. But I got up and we did it again, and again I failed to fall back and fully trust him. This time he threw me to the floor where I lay panting, gasping, and wondering why the hell I kept this up. You're gasping for breath, he asked sarcastically, towering above me, his bare feet wide apart and straddling my legs. His bare chest glistened with perspiration that dripped down to fall on me. I do all the hard work, and you lie there, sprawled out and exhausted looking. What happened to you down there? Did you use all your energy making it with your doctor? Shut up. I'm tired from twelve hours of continuous practice, that's all. If you're tired, I'm ten times more so, so get up and let's do it again. And get it right this time, God damn you. Don't you swear at me. Get yourself another partner. You tripped me up and made me fall, so my knee hurt for three days afterward. So how can I run and jump into your arms? You're mean enough to cripple me permanently. Even if I hated you, I wouldn't let you fall. And, Kathy, I don't hate you. Not yet. After practicing over and over again to the piano music, counting, timing, repeating the same number of steps, at last I got it right, and even Julian could smile and congratulate me. Then came the final dress rehearsal and the performance of Romeo and Juliet. It was the stunning sets and dazzling costumes that brought out the best in all of us when combined with a full orchestra. Now I could give to the role of Juliet all the little nuances that would make her real, and not some wooden stick that Yolanda appeared tonight as she did her plies while her eyes seemed glassy, unfocused. Madame Z came up to peer closely into her face, and then she sniffed Yolly's breath. By God, you've been smoking grass. No dancer of mine goes spaced out onto the stage and cheats my audience. Get home and to bed. Catherine, get ready to play Juliet. Yolanda staggered past me, then tried to give me a savage kick as she hissed, Why did you have to come back? Why didn't you stay down there where you belong? I didn't think of Yolanda and her threats as I stood on the flimsy balcony and gazed dreamily down into Julian's pale face that tilted upward to mine. He appeared so beautiful under the bluish lights, wearing white tights, with his dark hair gleaming, his jet eyes glittering along with the fake jewels on his medieval costume. He seemed to be my attic lover who would ever bound away from me and never let me near enough to see the features of his face. The applause thundered as the curtain lowered, and behind it, out of breath, Julian sprang up to hug me close. You were sensational tonight. How do you manage to frustrate me right up until the moment of performance? 
the curtain rose for our bows. Then he kissed me full on the lips. Bravo, they cried, for this was the sort of drama and passion all ballot domains craved. It was our night, the best yet, and drunk with success, I dashed past photographers and autograph hounds toward my dressing room, for there was a big bash afterward, a celebration before our company took off for London. Quickly I lathered on cold cream to take off the makeup, then I changed from my last act costume into a short formal of periwinkle blue. Madame Zolter rapped on my door and called out, Catherine, a lady here says she has flown all the way from your hometown to watch you dance. Come, open your door and we will hold up the party until you arrive. A tall, attractive woman entered. Dark-haired, dark-eyed, her clothes were expensive and flattering to her figure. For some strange reason, it seemed I'd met her before, or she reminded me of someone. She looked me over from head to toe, and only then did she turn to stare around the small dressing room filled with plastic bags jammed with all the costumes I was taking with me to England, each labelled with my name and the name of the ballet the costumes were designed for. I waited impatiently for her to have her say, then go, so I could get on to putting on my coat. I don't think I know you, I said to hurry her up. She smiled crookedly, then sat down uninvited to cross her nicely shaped legs. Rhythmically, she swung one foot in a high-heeled black pump back and forth. Of course you don't know me, my dear child, but I know a great deal about you. There was something in her sweet and too smooth tongue to warn me, and I stiffened, prepared for whatever she'd come to deliver, and it would be bad. I could tell from the mean look that hid beneath the false sweet one. You're very pretty, maybe even beautiful. Thank you. You dance exceptionally well. That surprised me. Though, of course, you would have to dance well to be with this company, which I've heard is fast becoming an important one. Thank you again, I said, thinking she'd never come to the point. She took a long time before she spoke again, keeping me in suspense, on edge. I picked up my coat, trying to signal to her that I was trying to leave. Nice fur coat, she commented. I suppose my brother gave you that? I've heard he's throwing away his money like a drunken sailor, giving all his save to three nobodies who came on a bus and took over his life. She laughed low and sarcastically, the way women of culture know how to laugh. Now I know why, seeing you, though I've heard from others you are pretty enough to make any man foolish. Still, I have no idea a child such as you could look so voluptuous, so sensual and skinny all at the same time. You are a peculiar blend, Miss Dahl. All innocence and sophistication, too. Such a brew must be heady intoxication for a man of my brother's type. She chortled. There's nothing like the combination of youth, long blonde hair, a beautiful face and full breasts to bring out the beast even in the best of men. She sighed as if pitying me. Yes, that's the trouble with being too young and beautiful. Men are made their worst selves. Paul's made an ass of himself before, you know. You're not his first little playmate, though he's never given one a fur coat before and a diamond ring, just as if he could possibly marry you. So this was Paul's sister, Amanda, the queer sister who knitted him sweaters and mailed them off parcel post but refused to speak to him on the streets. Amanda got up and prowled around me, a cat on the stalk ready to spring. Her perfume was oriental, musky, heavy, as she moved in on what she must think a timid prey. Such flawless skin you have, she said, reaching to stroke my cheek. So firm, like porcelain. You won't keep that skin or all that hair once you're thirty-five or so, and long before then he'll have tired of you. He likes his women young, very young. He likes them pretty, intelligent, and talented. I have to acknowledge he has good taste, if not good sense. You see, she smiled again, that hateful smile. I really don't give a damn what he does, as long as it stays within the limits of decency and doesn't reflect on my life. Get out of here, I managed to say. You don't know your brother at all. He's an honorable, generous man, and in no way could he harm your life. Pityingly, she smiled. 
My dear child, don't you realize you are ruining his career? Are you fool enough to think this affair has gone unnoticed? In a town the size of Claremont, everybody knows everything. Though Henny can't talk, the neighbors do have eyes and ears. Gossip, that's all I hear, gossip. Throwing away his money on juvenile delinquents to take advantage of his good nature. And soon enough he'll be broke and he won't have a medical practice left. She was heating up now, and I feared any moment she'd rake my face with her long red nails. Get out of here, I ordered hotly. I know all about you, Amanda, for gossip has reached my ears, too. Your trouble is you think your brother owes you the rest of his life because you worked to help put him through college and medical school. But I used to keep his books, and he's paid you back plus ten percent interest, so he doesn't owe you anything. You're a liar to try and make him seem small in my eyes, for you can't do that. I love him, and he loves me. And nothing you say can stop our marriage. She laughed again, hard and mirthless. Then her face turned hard, determined. Don't order me to do anything. When I'm ready to go, I'll leave. And that's when I've had my say. I flew up here just to see his newest little paramour, his dancing doll. And believe me, you won't be his last. Why, well, Julia used to tell me he... I hotly interrupted. Get out! Don't you dare say one word more about him. I know about Julia. He's told me. If she drove him to others, I don't blame him. She wasn't a real wife. She was a housekeeper, a cook, not a wife. Merrily, she laughed. God, how she liked to laugh. She was enjoying this. Someone competitive enough to fight back. Someone she could claw. Fool girl. That's the same old line every married man passes on to his newest conquest. Julia was one of the dearest, sweetest, kindest, and most wonderful women who ever lived. She did everything she could to please him. Her one fault lay in the fact she couldn't give him all the sex he wanted, or the kind of sex he demanded. Oh, yes, in a way he did have to turn to others, like you. I'll admit most married men fool around, but they still don't do what he did. I hated the spiteful witch now, really detested her. What's he done that was so terrible? Julia drowned his three-year-old son. There's nothing on earth that would make me take the life of my child. I don't need revenge that much. I agree, she said, back to mild tone now. That was an insane thing for Julia to do. Scotty was such a handsome, lovely boy. But Paul drove her to do what she did. I understand her reasoning. Scotty was the thing Paul loved most. When you seek to destroy someone emotionally, you kill what he loves best. Oh, the horror of her. He wears a hair shirt, doesn't he? She asked in a gloating way, her dark, pretty eyes glowing with satisfaction. He tortures himself, blames himself, longs for his son. And then you came along and he put a baby in you. Don't think the whole town doesn't know about your abortion. We know, we know everything. You lie, I shrieked. It wasn't an abortion. I had a D&C because my periods weren't regular. It's on the hospital records, she said to me smugly. You miscarried a two-headed embryo with three legs, twins who didn't separate properly. You poor thing, don't you know a D&C is an abortion procedure? Drowning, drowning, I was going under, black swirls of water all around. Two-headed, three legs, oh, God, the monster baby I so dreaded. But Paul hadn't touched me then, not Paul. Don't cry, she soothed, and I yanked from the touch of her large hand that flashed with diamonds. All men are beasts, and I guess he didn't tell you. But don't you see, you can't marry him. I'm doing this for your own good. You're beautiful, young, gifted, and to live in sin with a married man is a pure waste. Save yourself while you can. Tears blurred my vision. I rubbed at my eyes as a child would, feeling a child in a crazy adult world as I stared dully at her bland, smooth face. Paul's not a married man. Paul's a widower. Julia's dead. She killed herself the day she drowned Scotty. Like a mother, she patted my shoulder. No child. Julia is not dead. Julia lives in an institution where my brother put her after she drowned Scotty. She's still his legal wife, insane or not. 
she thrust into my slack hand several snapshots, pictures of a thin, pitiful-looking woman lying on a hospital bed, her face in profile in both, a woman ravaged by suffering, her eyes wide open and staring blankly into space, and her dark hair lay like strings on the pillows. Yet I'd seen too many pictures of Julia not to recognize her, even as changed as she was. By the way, said Paul's sister, leaving me with the snapshots. I enjoyed the performance. You're a marvelous dancer. And that young man, he's spectacular. Take him. He's obviously in love with you. She left then, left me in a daze of broken dreams and floundering in despair. How was I ever going to learn to swim in an ocean of deceit? Julian took me to the big bash which was being thrown in our honor. Hordes of people surrounded us, congratulated us, said so many flattering words. They meant nothing to me. All I could think was Paul had lied to me, lied to me, took me when he knew he was married. Lies. I hated lies. Never had Julian been sweeter or more considerate. He held me close in one of those slow, old-fashioned dances, so close I could feel every hard muscle of his lean body and the maleness of him pressed hard, hard. I love you, Kathy, he whispered. I want you so much I can't sleep at night. I want to hold you, make love to you. If you don't let me soon, I'll go mad. He buried his face in my piled-up hair. I've never had anyone brand new like you, Kathy, please, please love me, love me. His face swam before me. He seemed dream godlike, perfect. And yet, and yet, Julian, what if I told you I wasn't brand new? But you are, I know you are. How can you tell? I giggled drunkenly. Is there something written on my face that says I am still a virgin? Yes, he said firmly, your eyes. Your eyes tell me you don't know what it's like to be loved. Julian, I fear you don't know much. You underestimate me, Kathy. You treat me like a little boy one minute and the next like some hungry wolf who will eat you up. Let me make love to you. Then you'll know no man has ever touched you before. I laughed. All right, but one night only. If you have me for one night, you will never, never want me to go, he warned and his eyes glowed and sparkled, black as coal. Julian, I don't love you. But you will, after tonight. Oh, Julian, I said with a long yawn, I'm tired and partially drunk. Go away, leave me alone. Not on your life, kiddo. You said yes, and I'm holding you to it. It's me tonight, and every night for the rest of your life, or mine. On a rainy Saturday morning, with all our luggage already piled into the taxis that would take our company to the airport, Julian and I stood in the city hall with our best friends to support us, and a judge said the words that would bind us together until death you do part. When it came my turn to speak my vows, I hesitated, wanting to run away and fly to Paul. He would be crushed when he found out. Then there was Chris. But Chris would rather see me marry Julian than Paul. That's what he told me. Julian held tight to me, his dark eyes soft and shining with love and pride. I couldn't run. I could only say what I was supposed to. And then I was married to the one man I'd sworn I would never allow to touch me intimately. Not only Julian was happy and proud, but also Madame Zolta, who beamed at us and gave us her blessings kissed our cheeks and shed motherly tears. You've done the right thing, Catherine. You will be so happy together, such a beautiful couple. But remember not to make any babies. Darling, sweetheart, love, Julian whispered when we were on the plane flying over the Atlantic. Don't look so sad. This is our day for rejoicing. I swear you will never be sorry. I'll make you a fantastic husband. I'll never love anyone but you. My head bowed down on his shoulder. Then I bawled, crying for everything that should have been mine on my wedding day. 
Where were my bird song, the bells that should chime? Where was the green grass and the love that was mine? Where was my mother, who was the cause of everything gone wrong? Where? Did she cry when she thought of us? Or did she more likely just take my notes with the news clippings and tear them up? Yes, that would be like her, never to face up to what she'd done. How easily she tripped away on her second honeymoon and left us in the care of a merciless grandmother. And back she came all smiling and happy, telling us of what a wonderful time she had. While we, locked up, had been brutalized and starved. She'd never even looked at Corey and Carrie, who didn't grow. Never noticed how shadowed their hollow eyes, how thin their weak legs and arms. Never noticed anything she didn't want to see. The rain kept coming down, down, forecasting what was ahead. That cold, blasting torrent of freezing water put ice on the wings of the plane that was carrying me farther and farther from all those I loved. That ice was in my heart, too. And tonight I had to sleep with a man I didn't even like when he wasn't on stage and dressed in costume and playing the role of a prince. But to give Julian his due, he was all he boasted of being in bed. I forgot who he was and pretended he was someone else as his kisses played over my body and not one inch went unexplored, unkissed or uncaressed. Before he finished, I wanted him. I was more than willing to have him take me and try to erase the persistent thought that I had just made the worst mistake of my life. And I had made many mistakes. Chapter 19 Labyrinth of Lies Before our bodies had adjusted to jet lag, we went into rehearsals with the Royal Ballet looking on, comparing our style to theirs. Already, Madame Z had told us their way was strictly classical, but we were to do everything in our own way and were not to be intimidated. Stick to your guns. Keep it pure, but make each dance your very own. Julian, Catherine, as newlyweds, all eyes will be upon you too, so make every scene as romantic as you can. The two of you together touch my heart and make it cry, and if you keep it up what you're doing, you may make ballet history. She smiled, and tears filled the deep furrows about her tiny eyes. Let us all prove that America, too, can produce the very best. She broke then and turned her back, so we couldn't see her face crumple. I love all of you so much, she sobbed. Now go away, leave me be, and make me proud of you. We were determined to do our very damnedest to make Madame Zolta's name famous once more, not as a dancer, but as a teacher. We practiced until we fell exhausted into our beds. The Royal Opera House Covent Garden shared its space with the ballet company, and when I first saw it, I sucked in my breath and held fast to Julian's hand. The red and gold auditorium seated more than 2,000 people. Its sparkling swirl of balconies that rose up to a high dome with a sunburst design in the middle stunned me with its old-fashioned splendor. Soon we were to find out that backstage was far less opulent, with no charm in its crowded dressing rooms and a rabbit warren of tiny offices and workrooms, worst of all, no rehearsal studios at all. Try as I would to find something admirable about British plumbing and heating facilities, I failed utterly. I was forever cold, except under the duress of dancing. I hated the stingy supply of hot water in the bathrooms forcing me to take the quickest bath possible before I froze to death. And all the time Julian stayed glued to my side. Privacy was something he'd never heard of and had no respect for. Even when I was in the bathroom he had to be there, so I'd race to lock the door and leave him pounding. Let me in! I know what you're doing. Why all the secrecy? Not only that, he wanted to crawl into my mind and know all my past, all my thoughts, everything I'd done. And so your mother and father were killed in an auto crash. What happened next? He asked, holding me in an iron embrace. Why did he have to hear it again? I swallowed. By now I had concocted a believable story about the law wanting to put us in an orphanage, so Chris, Carrie, and I had to run away. We had a little money saved up, you know, from birthdays, Christmas and such. We caught a bus that would take us to Florida, but Carrie was sick and threw up, 
and this huge, fat black lady came and took us to her doctor's son. I guess he felt sorry for us. He took us in, and that's all there is to it. All there is to it, he repeated slowly. There's a hell of a lot you're not telling me, though I can guess the rest. He saw a rich plum in a young, beautiful girl, and that's why he was so damn generous. Kathy, just how intimate were you with him? I loved him, and I planned to marry him. Then why didn't you, he shot out. Why did you finally say yes to me? Tact and subtlety were never among my virtues. I grew angry because he was making me explain when I didn't want to explain. You were at me all the time, I stormed. You made me believe I could learn to love you, but I don't think I can. You've made a mistake, Julian, a horrible mistake. Don't you say anything like that again, you hear? Julian sobbed as if I'd wounded him terribly, and I was reminded of Chris. I couldn't go through my life damaging everyone I met, so my rage vanished as I allowed him to take me in his arms. His dark head lowered so he could kiss my neck. Kathy, I love you so much, more than I ever wanted to love any woman. I've never had anyone love me for myself. Thank you for trying to love me, even though you say you don't. It hurt to hear the quiver in his voice. He seemed a small boy who was pleading for the impossible to happen, and perhaps I was doing him an injustice. I turned and wrapped my arms around his neck. I do want to love you, Jewel. I did marry you, and I am committed, so I'll try and make you the best wife I can. But don't push at me. Don't make demands. Just let love come as I learn more about you. You're almost a stranger to me, even though we've known each other for three years. He winced as if, if I ever really knew him, then love would be indeed impossible. He doubted himself so much. Oh, God, what had I done? What kind of person was I that I could turn from an honest, sincere, honorable man and rush headlong into the arms of someone I suspected was a brute? Mama had a way of acting impulsively and being sorry when it was too late. I wasn't like her underneath. I couldn't be. I had too many talents to be like someone who had none. None but for making every man fall in love with her, and that wasn't intelligence. No, I wanted to be like Chris. And then I floundered again, caught, as always, in the quicksand of her making. All of it was her fault, even my marriage to Julian. Kathy, you're going to have to learn to overlook a lot of flaws, said Julian. Don't put me up on a pedestal. Don't expect perfection. I have feet of clay, as you already know, and if you try to make me into the Prince Charming I think you want, you are going to fail. You have that doctor of yours on a pedestal, too. I think you might be the kind to put all the men you love up so high they are bound to come tumbling down. Just love me and try not to see what doesn't please you. I wasn't good at overlooking faults. I'd always seen mamas when Chris never had. I always flipped over the brightest coin and looked for the tarnish. Funny, Paul's tarnish had seemed all Julia's fault until Amanda came with her horror story. Another reason to hate Mama, making me doubt my instinct. Long after Julian returned to bed, I sat by the windows and contemplated myself, my eyes fixed on the long shivelets of ice striking the glass. The weather was only telling me what lay ahead. Spring was back there in the garden with Paul. And I'd done it myself. I didn't have to believe Amanda. God help me if I turned out to be like Mama inside as well as out. Our weeks in London were busy, exciting, and exhausting. But I dreaded the time when we returned to New York. How long could I keep putting off telling Paul? Not forever. Sooner or later he had to know. Shortly before the first day of spring, we flew back to Claremont, and we taxied to Paul's house. It was the place of our deliverance, and it seemed nothing there had changed. Only I had, for I was coming to devastate a man who didn't need to be hurt again. I stared at the boxwoods neatly clipped into cones and spears, and the wisteria trees that were blooming. Azaleas rioted colorfully everywhere, and the big magnolias were ripe and soon to flower, 
and over everything emerald draped the dangling grey Spanish moss, misting and fogging to create shreds of living lace. I sighed. If at twilight there was anything more beautiful and somehow romantically, sadly mystical than a live oak dripping with Spanish moss that would in the end kill its host, I've yet to see it. Love that clung and killed. I thought I could take Julian inside, then tell Paul our news, but I couldn't. Would you mind waiting on the veranda until I tell Paul, I asked. For some reason he only nodded. I'd expected an argument. Agreeably, for a change, he sat in a white wicker rocker, the same one Paul had been in when first we found him dozing on that Sunday afternoon after the bus put us off. He'd been forty then. He was now forty-three. Quivering a little, I went on alone to open the front door with my own key. I could have telephoned or sent a cable, but I had to see his face and watch his eyes and try to read his thoughts. I needed to know if I'd really injured his heart or only wounded his pride and ego. No one heard me open the door. No one heard my footsteps on the hard parquet of the foyer. Paul was sprawled in his favourite chair before the colour television in the fireplace, dozing. His long legs were stretched to rest on the matching ottoman, his ankles crossed and his shoes off. Carrie was sitting cross-legged on the floor near his chair, as needing as always to be near someone who loved her. She was deeply engrossed in her play with the small porcelain dolls. She wore a white sweater, banded at the neck and wrists with purple, and over this her red corduroy jumper. She looked like a pretty little doll. My eyes went again to Paul. In his light dozing sleep he had the expression of someone anxiously waiting. Even his feet moved off and across and uncross, while his fingers flexed into fists, then unflexed. His head was thrown back to rest on the high back of his chair, but that too kept moving from side to side. Dreaming, I thought, maybe of me. Then his face turned in my direction. Did he sense my presence even in his sleep? Ever so slowly his eyelids fluttered open. He yawned and lifted a hand to cover his mouth, then stared at me fuzzily as if I were merely an apparition. Catherine, he murmured, is that you? Carrie heard his question, jumped up and came flying to me, crying out my name as I caught her and swung her high. I lavished on her small face a dozen or so kisses and hugged her so tight she cried out, Ouch! That hurts! She looked so pretty, so fresh and well-fed, Oh, Kathy, why did you stay away so long? We wait every day for you to come home and you never do. We make plans for your wedding, but when you don't write, Dr. Paul says we should wait. Why did you send only postcards? Didn't you have time to write long letters? Chris said you must be awfully busy. She had pulled out of my arms and was back on the floor near Paul's chair and staring at me reproachfully. Kathy, you forgot all about us, didn't you? All you care about is dancing. You don't need no family when you dance. Yes, I do need a family, Carrie, I said absently, with my eyes fixed on Paul, trying to read what he was thinking. Paul got up and came toward me, his eyes locked with mine. We embraced, and Carrie sat quietly on the floor and watched, as if studying the way a woman should act with the man she loved. His lips only brushed over mine, yet his touch shivered me as Julian's never did. You look different, he said to me in his slow, soft way. You've lost weight. You look tired, too. Why didn't you telephone or telegraph to let me know you were on the way? I would have met you at the airport. You look thinner, too, I said in a hoarse whisper. His weight loss was far more becoming than mine, his moustache seemed darker, thicker. I touched it tentatively, longingly, knowing it wasn't mine to feel now, and he had grown it just to please me. It hurt when you stopped writing to me every day. Did you stop when your schedule became too crowded? Something like that. It's tiring to dance every day and try to see as much as possible at the same time. I got so busy I never had enough time. I subscribe to variety now. 
Oh, was all I could say, praying they didn't write about my marriage to Julian. I've nominated myself as your clipping service, though Chris is keeping a scrapbook too. Whenever he's home, we compare clippings. If one of us has something the other doesn't, we have it photocopied. He paused as if puzzled by my expression, my demeanor, something. They're all rave reviews. Catherine, why do you look so, so emotionless? Tired, like you said. I hung my head, not knowing what to say or how to meet his eyes. And how have you been? Catherine, is something the matter? You act strange. Carrie was staring at me, as if Paul had expressed her thoughts too. I gazed around the big room, filled with the beauty of all that Paul had collected. Sunlight through the ivory shears shone on the miniatures in his tall étagère with the glass shelves, the black gold-veined mirror behind them, and lit from the top and bottom. How easy to hide away in looking around, pretending everything was all right when everything was all wrong. Catherine, speak to me, Paul cried. There is something wrong. I sat down, knees weak, my throat tight. Why couldn't I ever do anything right? How could he have lied to me, deceived me, when he knew I'd had enough of lying and deceit? And how could he look so trustworthy still? When will Chris be home? Friday, for Easter vacation. His long look was reflective, as if he thought it strange when usually Chris and I kept in constant communication. Then there was Henny to greet and hug and kiss, and I could put it off no longer, though I found a way. Paul, I brought Julian home with me. He's out on the veranda waiting. Is that all right? He gave me the strangest look and then nodded. Of course. Ask him in. Then he turned to Henny. Set two more places, Henny. Julian came in, and as I'd cautioned him, he didn't say a word to let anyone know we were married. Both of us had taken off our wedding rings and had them in our pockets. It was the strangest of quiet meals, and even when Julian and I handed out the gifts, the stiffness grew, and Carrie only glanced at her bracelet of rubies and amethysts, though Henny beamed a broad smile when she put on her solid gold bracelet. Thank you for the lovely figurine of yourself, Kathy, said Paul, putting it carefully aside on the closest table. Julian, would you please excuse Kathy and me for a while? I'd like to have a private talk with her. He said this as a doctor requesting a private interview with a responsible family member of a critically ill patient. Julian nodded and smiled at Carrie. She glared back at him. I'm going to bed, stated Carrie defiantly. Good night, Mr. Marquette. I don't know why you had to help Kathy buy me that bracelet, but thank you anyway. Julian was left in the living room to stare at the TV as Paul and I took off for a stroll in his magnificent garden. Already his fruit trees were in bloom, and climbing red, pink, and white roses made a brilliant display on the white trellises. What's wrong, Catherine? Paul asked. You come home to me and bring along another man, so maybe you don't have to explain at all. I can guess. Quickly I put out my hand to seize hold of his. Stop! Don't say anything. Falteringly and very slowly, I began to tell him about his sister's visit. I told him I knew now that Julia was still alive, though I could understand his motivation. He should have told me the truth. Why did you lead me to believe she was dead, Paul? Did you think me such a child I couldn't bear to hear it? I could have understood if you had told me. I loved you. Don't you ever doubt that I did. I didn't give to you because I thought I owed you anything. I gave because I wanted to give, because I desperately needed you. I knew better than to expect marriage, and I was happy enough in the relationship we had. I would have been your mistress forever. But you should have told me about Julia. I act without thought when I'm hurt, and it hurt terribly that night Amanda came and told me your wife was still alive. Lies, I cried. Oh, how I hate liars. You of all people to lie to me. Besides, Chris, there was no one I trusted more than you. He'd stopped strolling, as I had. The nude marble statues were all around, mocking us. 
laughing at love gone awry, for now we were like them, frozen and cold. Amanda, he said, rolling her name on his tongue as something bitter and fit to be spit out. Amanda and her half-truths. You ask why? Why didn't you ask why before you flew to London? Why didn't you give me the chance to defend myself? How can you defend lies? I bit back meanly, wanting to hurt him, as I'd hurt that night when Amanda slammed out of the theater. He walked away to lean against the oldest oak, and from his pocket he drew a pack of cigarettes. Paul, I'm sorry. Tell me now what your defense would have been. Slowly he puffed on the cigarette and exhaled smoke. That smoke came my way and weaved around my head, neck, body, and chased off the scent of roses. Remember when you came, he began, taking his time. You were so bitter from your loss of Corey, to say nothing of how you felt about your mother. How could I tell you my own sordid story when already you'd known too much pain? How was I to know you and I would become lovers? You seem to me only a beautiful, haunted child, though you've touched me deeply. Always you've touched me. You touch me now, standing there with your accusing eyes. No, you are right. I should have told you. He sighed heavily. I told you about the day Scotty was three, and how Julia took him down to the river and held him under the water until he was dead. But what I didn't tell you was she lived on. A whole team of doctors worked on her for hours on end trying to bring her out of the coma, but she never came out. Coma? I whispered. She's alive now and still in the same coma? He smiled so bitterly and then looked up at the moon that was smiling too, sarcastically, I thought. He turned his head and allowed his eyes to meet with mine. Yes, Julia lived on with her heart beating, and before you came along with your brother and sister, I drove every day to visit her in a private institution. I'd sit beside her bed, hold her hand, and force myself to look at her gaunt face and skeleton body. It was the best way I had to torment myself and try to wash away the guilt I felt. I watched her hair become thinner each day, the pillows, covers, everything covered by her hair as she withered away before my very eyes. She was connected to tubes that helped her to breathe, and a tube was in her arm through which she was fed. Her brain waves were flat, but her heart kept on beating. Mentally she was dead, physically she was alive, if she ever came out of the coma, she'd never speak, move, or even be able to think. She'd have been a living, dead woman at the age of 26. That's how old she was when she took my son down to the river to hold him under the shallow water. It was hard for me to believe a woman who loved her child so much could drown him and feel his struggles to live. And yet she did it just to get back at me. He paused flicked the ash from his cigarette and turned his shadowed eyes to me. Julia reminds me of your mother. Both could do anything when they felt justified. I sighed, he sighed, and the wind and flowers sighed too. I think those marble statues sighed along as well in their lack of understanding the human condition. Paul, when did you see Julia last? Doesn't she have any chance at all for a full recovery? I began to cry. He gathered me in his arms and kissed the top of my head. Don't cry for her, my beautiful Catherine. It's all over for Julia now. She is finally at peace. The year we became lovers, she died less than a month after we started. Quietly, she just slipped away. I remember at the time you looked at me as if you sensed something was wrong wasn't that I felt less for you that made me stand back and look at myself. It was a blend of painful guilt and sorrow that someone as sweet and lovely as Julia, my childhood sweetheart, had to leave life without once experiencing all the wonderful, beautiful things it had to give. He cupped my face between his palms and tenderly kissed away my tears. Now smile and say the words I see in your eyes. Say you love me. When you brought Julian home with you, I thought it was over between us. But now I can tell it will never be over. You've given me the best you have within you, 
and I'll know that even when you're off thousands of miles dancing with younger and handsomer men, you'll be faithful to me, and I'll be faithful to you. We'll make it work, because two people who are sincerely in love can always overcome obstacles, no matter what they are. Oh, how could I tell him now? Julia's dead, I asked, quivering deep in shock, hating myself and Amanda. Amanda lied to me. She knew Julia was dead, and yet she flew to New York to tell me a lie. Paul, what kind of woman is she? He held me so tight I felt my ribs ache, but I clung just as fast to him, knowing this was the last time I could. I kissed him wild and passionately, knowing I'd never feel his lips again on mine. He laughed jubilantly, sensing all the love and passion I had for him, and in a happy, lighter voice he said, Yes, my sister knew when Julia died she was at her funeral, though she didn't speak to me. Now please stop crying. Let me dry your tears. He used his handkerchief to touch to my cheeks and the corners of my eyes, then held it so I could blow my nose. I'd acted the child, the impulsive, impatient child Chris had warned me not to be, and I had betrayed Paul, who trusted me. I still don't understand, Amanda, I said in a mournful wail, still putting off that moment of truth I didn't know if I could face. He held me and stroked my back, my hair, as I clung with my arms about his waist, staring up into his face. Sweetheart, Catherine, why do you look and act so strange, he said, in his voice that had gone back to normal. Nothing my sister said should rob us of taking what joy we can from life. Amanda wants to drive me out of Claremont. She wants to take over this house so she can leave it to her son, so she does her best to ruin my reputation. She's very active socially and fills the ears of her friends with lies about me. And if there were women before Julia drowned my son, that was lesson enough for me to change my ways. There was no other woman until you. I've even heard it rumored that Amanda has spread it about that I made you pregnant and your D&C was actually an abortion. You see what a spiteful woman can do? Anything. Now it was too late. Too late. He asked me again to stop crying. Amanda, I said stiffly, my control about to break. She said that a D&C was the same as an abortion. She said you kept the embryo, one with two heads. I've seen that thing in your office in a bottle. Paul, how could you keep it? Why didn't you have it buried? A monster baby. It isn't fair. It isn't. Why? Why? He groaned and wiped his hand over his eyes to quickly deny everything. I could kill her for telling you that. A lie, Catherine. All a lie. Was it a lie? It could have been mine. You know that. For God's sake, Chris doesn't know. He didn't lie to me too, did he? He sounded frantic as he denied everything and sought once more to embrace me, but I jumped backward and thrust forth both arms to ward him off. There is a bottle in your office with a baby like that inside. I saw it. Paul, how could you? You, of all people, to save something like that. No, he flared immediately. That thing was given to me years ago when I was in med school. A joke, really. Med students play all sorts of jokes you'd find gruesome. And I'm telling you the truth, Catherine, you didn't abort. Then he stopped abruptly, just as I did with my thoughts reeling. I'd betrayed myself. I began to cry. Chris, Chris, there was a baby. There was a monster, just like we feared. No, said Paul again and again. It's not yours. And even if it were, it wouldn't make any difference to me. I know you and Chris love each other in a special way. I've always known it, and I do understand. Once, I whispered through my sobs, only once on one terrible night. I'm sorry it was terrible. I stared up at him then, marveling that he could look at me with so much softness and so much respect, even knowing the full truth. Paul, I asked tremulously, timidly, was it an unforgivable sin? No, an understandable act of love, I'd call it. 
He held me, he kissed me, he stroked my back, and began telling me his plans for our wedding. And Chris will give you away, and Carrie will be your bridesmaid. Chris was very hesitant and wouldn't meet my eyes when I discussed this with him. He said he thought you weren't mature enough to handle a complicated marriage like ours will be. I know it's not going to be easy for you, or for me. You'll be touring the world, dancing with young, handsome men. However, I'm looking forward to accompanying you on a few of those tours. To be the husband of a prima ballerina will be inspiring, exciting. Why, I could even be your company doctor. Surely dancers need doctors on occasion. I went dead inside. Paul, I began dully, I can't marry you. Then, quite out of context, I went on. You know, wasn't it stupid of Mama to hide our birth certificates inside the linings of our two suitcases? She didn't do too good a job, and the linings ripped, and I found them. Without my birth certificate, I couldn't have applied for a passport, and I also needed that certificate to prove I was of age to apply for a marriage license. You see, several days before our company flew to London, Julian and I had blood tests, and our marriage ceremony was just a simple one, with Madame Zolta and the company dancers there. And even as I said my marriage vows and swore fidelity to Julian, I was thinking of you and Chris and hating myself and knowing I was doing the wrong thing. Paul didn't say anything. He reeled backward, then staggered over to fall upon a marble bench. For moments he just sat, and then his head drooped into his hands and hid his face. I stood. He sat. He lost himself somewhere while I waited for him to come back and rail at me. But his voice, when it came, was as soft as a whisper. Come, sit beside me for a while. Hold my hand. Give me time to realize it's all over between us. I did as he said and held his hand while both of us stared up at the sky full of diamonds and dark clouds. I'll never hear your kind of music again without thinking of you. Paul, I'm sorry. I wish to God I'd have listened to my instinct that told me Amanda was lying. But the music was playing where I was, too, and you were far away, and Julian was there pleading with me, telling me he loved me and needed me. And I believed him and convinced myself you didn't really love me. I can't bear to be without someone who loves me. I'm very happy he loves you, he said, then got up quickly and started for the house, his stride so long and fast I'd never catch up even if I ran. Don't say another word. Leave me alone, Catherine. Don't follow me. You did the right thing, don't doubt that. I was an old fool playing with a young one, and you don't have to tell me I should have known better. I already know that. Chapter 20 Too Many Loves to Lose Gone as deaf and stony as one of Paul's marble statues, I sat on the veranda and stared up at the night sky that was turning stormy and black with clouds. Julian came out to sit beside me, and in his embrace I began to softly cry. Why, he asked, you do love me a little, don't you? Your doctor can't be really hurt. He was very kind to me and told me to come out and comfort you. It was then that Henny came out to signal with her lightning-fast signs that her doctor son was packing for a trip and I was to stay here. What's she saying to you? asked Julian with annoyance. Damn, it's like hearing someone talk in a foreign tongue. I feel so left out. Stay here and wait, I ordered, then jumped up to race into the house and fly up the back stairs then on into Paul's room, where he was flinging his clothes into an open suitcase on his bed. Look, I cried in distress, there's no reason why you have to leave. This is your home. I'll go. I'll take Carrie with me so you need never see my face again. He turned to give me a long and bitter look as he went on putting shirts in his bag. Kathy, you've taken the wife I expected to have, and now you want to take away my daughter? Carrie is like my own flesh and blood, and she wouldn't fit into your kind of life. Let her stay with me and Henny. Let me have something to call my own. 
I'll be back before you go. And you should know that Julian's father is very, very ill. George is ill? Yes. Perhaps you don't know that he's had kidney disease for several years and has been on a dialysis machine for months. I don't think he'll live much longer. He's not my patient, but I stop in to visit him as often as I can, more or less to hear about you and Julian. Now, will you please get out, Kathy, and not force me to say things I'd regret? I cried face down on my bed until Henny came into my room. Strong, motherly, dark hands patted my back. Henny's misting, liquid brown eyes spoke when her tongue couldn't. She talked to me with her gestures and then took from her apron pocket a clipping from the local newspaper. An announcement of my marriage to Julian. Henny, I wailed. What am I going to do? I'm married to Julian and I can't demand a divorce. He depends on me, believes in me. Henny shrugged her broad shoulders, expressing that people were as complex to her as they were to me. Then quickly she signaled, Big sister, always been big troublemaker. One man already hurt, no good hurting two. Dr. Goodman, strong man, will survive disappointment, but young dancing man might not. Wipe away tears, cry no more, put on big smile, and go downstairs and take hand of new husband. For everything work out for the best. You see. I did as Henny directed and joined Julian in the living room, and there I told him about his father being in the hospital and not expected to live. His pale face went even whiter. Nervously, he chewed on his lower lip. It's really that serious? It had been my opinion that Julian didn't care much for his father, so I was surprised to see his reaction. At that moment, Paul came into the living room with his suitcase and offered to drive us to the hospital. And remember, my house has plenty of rooms, and there is no reason at all why the two of you should even consider a hotel. Stay as long as you like. I'll be back in a few days. He backed his car out of the garage so Julian and I could join him on the front seat. Hardly a word was said until he let us out in front of the hospital, and sadly I hesitated before the steps, watching Paul drive away into the night. They had George in a private room, and with him was Madame Marisha. When I saw George in the bed, I drew in my breath. Oh, to be like that! He was so thin, he seemed already dead. His face had a grayish pallor, and every bone he had jutted forward to make jagged peaks beneath the thin skin. Madame M. was crouched at his side, staring down into his gaunt face, pleading with her eyes, commanding him to hold on and live. My love, my love, my love, she crooned as to a baby. Do not go, do not leave me alone. We have so much to do yet, to experience yet. Our son has to reach fame before you die. Hold on, my love, hold on. Only then did Madame Marisha glance up to see us there, and with her same old authority she snapped, Well, Julian, you did finally come, and after all the cables I sent you, what did you do, tear them up and dance on as if nothing matters? I blanched, very surprised, and looked from him to Madame. My dear mother he said coldly. We were on tour, you know that. We had engagements and contracts, so my wife and I kept our commitments. You heartless brute, she snarled, then gestured for him to come closer. Now you say something kind and loving to that man on the bed, she hissed in a whisper. Oh, so help me, God, I'll make you wish you were never born. Julian had a great deal of trouble making the effort to approach the bed, so much so I had to give him a shove while his mother sobbed into a handful of pink tissues. Hello, father, was all he could manage, along with, I'm sorry you're so ill. Quickly he came back to me and held me hard against him. I felt his whole body trembling. See, my love, my sweetheart, my darling, crooned Madame Marisha again once more bending above her husband and smoothing back his damp, dark hair. 
open your dear eyes and see who has flown thousands of miles to be at your side, your own Julian and his wife. All the way from London they flew the moment they knew you were so sick. Open your eyes, my heart. See him again, see them together. Such a beautiful pair of newlyweds. Please open your eyes, please look. On the bed, the pale, thin wraith of a man slitted his dark eyes, and they moved slowly, trying to focus on Julian and me. We were at the foot of his bed, but he didn't seem to see us. Madame got up to push us closer, and then held Julian there so he couldn't back off. Georges opened his eyes a bit wider and thinly smiled. Ah, Julian, he sighed. Thank you for coming. I have so much to say to you. Things I should have said before, he faltered, stammered. I should have... And then he broke off. I waited for him to continue, and I waited. I saw his wide-open eyes glaze and go blank, and his head stayed so still. Madame screamed. A doctor and nurse came on the run and shooed us out as they began to work over Georges. We formed a pitiful group in the hall outside his room, and in only a short while the grey-haired doctor came out to say he was sorry all had been done that could be done. It was over. It is better so, he added. Death can be a good friend to those in extreme pain. I wondered how he held on for so long. I stared and stared at Julian, for we could have come back sooner. But Julian made his eyes blank and refused to speak. He was your father! screamed Madame as tears streaked her cheeks. For two weeks he suffered, waiting to see you before he could let himself die and escape the hell of living on. Julian whirled, his pale skin flamed with bright red fury as he lashed out at his mother. Madame, mother, just what did my father give me? All I was to him was an extension of himself. All he was to me was a dance instructor. Work, dance, that's all he ever said. He never discussed what I wanted besides the dance. He didn't give a damn what else I wanted or what else I needed. I wanted him to love me for myself. I wanted him to see me as his son, not just as a dancer. I loved him. I wanted him to see I loved him and say he loved me in return. But he never did. And try as I would to dance perfectly, he never gave me a compliment. For I didn't do anything nearly as well as he could have done it when he was my age. So that is what I was to him, somebody to step into his shoes and carry on his name. But damn him and you, I've got my own legal name, Julian Marquette, not Georges Rosenkopf, and his name will not live on and steal from me what fame I achieve. I held Julian in my arms that night, understanding him as I hadn't before. When he broke and cried, I cried along with him, for a father he'd professed to despise when underneath he loved him. And I thought of Georges and how sad it was that he tried too late to say what he should have years and years ago. So we come from a honeymoon where we had achieved a certain amount of fame and publicity and given many, many hours of hard work, only to attend the funeral of a father who wouldn't live to know about his son's accomplishments. All the glory of London now seemed shrouded in funeral mists. Madame Marisha held out her arms to me when the graveside ceremony was over. She held me in her thin arms as she might have once held Julian, and in a sort of hypnotic trance we rocked back and forth, both of us crying. Be good to my son, Catherine, she sobbed and sniffled. Have patience with him when he acts wild. This has not been an easy life for much of what he says is true. Always he felt himself in competition with his father, and never could he surpass his father's abilities. Now I will tell you something. My Julien has a love for you that is almost holy. He thinks you are the best thing that has ever happened in his life, and to him you are without flaw. If you have flaws, hide them. He won't understand. A hundred times he's been in and out of love, all within the space of a few months. For years you frustrated him. So, now that he's your husband, give to him generously all the love that's been denied. 
for I am not a demonstrative woman. I have always wanted to be, but somehow I could never humble myself to touch first. Touch him often, Catherine. Take his hand, then he would pull from you and go up and sulk alone. Understand why he is moody and love him three times as much. That way you will bring out the best in him, for he does have admirable qualities. He has to, for he is Georges' son. She kissed me and said goodbye for a while and made me swear to come with Julian often on visits. Sit me in the corners of your life, she said, with sadness making her face long and hollow-eyed. But when I promised and turned to look, Julian was glaring hard at the both of us. Chris came home for his Easter vacation, and less than eagerly he greeted Julian. I noticed Julian glaring at him with narrowed, suspicious eyes. No sooner were Chris and I alone when he bellowed, You married him? Why couldn't you wait? How could you be so intuitive when we were locked away and so damn dumb now that we're out? I was wrong not wanting you to marry Paul only because he is so much older. And I admitted I was jealous and didn't want you to marry anyone. I had a dream of you and me. Some day. Well, you know what I dreamed. But if it had to be a choice between Paul and Julian, then it should have been Paul. He's the one who took us in and fed and clothed us and gave us the best of everything. I don't like Julian. He'll destroy you. He hesitated, turning his back so I couldn't see his face. He was twenty-one and beginning to take on the virile strength of a man. In him I could see so much of our father and our mother. And when I wanted to, I could take things and twist them to suit my purpose. And so I thought he was more like Mama in some ways than like Daddy. I started to say this, and then I too floundered, for I couldn't. He wasn't anything at all like our mother. Chris was strong, she was weak. He was noble. She was without any honor at all. Chris, don't make it harder for me. Let's be friends again. Julian is hot-headed and arrogant and a lot of things that irritate on the surface, but underneath he's a little boy. But you don't love him, he said, without meeting my eyes. In a few hours, Julian and I would be leaving. I asked Carrie if she would like to come and live in New York with us. But I had lost her trust. I had betrayed her too many times already, and she let me know it. You go on back to New York, Kathy, where it snows all the time and muggers get you in the park and killers get you in the subway. But you leave me here. I used to want to be with you. Now I don't care. You went and married that old Julian with the black eyes when you could have been Dr. Paul's wife and my real mother. I'll marry him. You think he won't want me because I'm too little, but he will. You think he's too old for me, but I won't be able to get anybody else. So he'll feel sorry and marry me and we'll have six children. You just wait and see. Carrie, shut up. I don't like you now. Go away. Stay away. Dance until you die. Chris and me don't want you. Nobody here wants you. Those scream words hurt. My Carrie yelling at me to go away when I'd been like a mother to her most of her life. Then I looked over to where Chris was standing before the pink sweetheart roses, his shoulders sagging, and in his eyes, oh, those blue, blue eyes, that look would always follow me. Never, never was his love going to set me free to love anyone without reservations, as long as he kept loving me. Just an hour before we had to leave for the airport, Paul's car turned into the drive. He smiled at me as he always smiled, as if nothing between us had changed. He had some tale to tell Julian of a medical convention that had kept him away, and he was terribly sad and sorry to hear his father had died. He shook hands with Chris, then slapped him heartily on the back, the way men so commonly showed affection to one another. He greeted Henny kissed Carrie and gave her a little box of candy, and only then did he look at me. Hello, Kathy. That told me so much. I was no longer Catherine, the woman he could love as an equal. I had been moved back to only a daughter. And, Kathy, you can't take Carrie with you to New York. 
She belongs with me and Henny, so she can see her brother from time to time, and I'd hate for her to change schools, too. I wouldn't leave you for nothing, said Carrie staunchly. Julian went upstairs to finish packing his things, and I dared to follow Paul out into the garden, despite the forbidding look Chris gave me. He was down on his knees, still wearing a good suit, pulling up a few weeds someone had overlooked. He got up quickly when he heard my steps and brushed the grass from his trousers. Then he stared off into space as if the last thing he wanted to do was to look at me. Paul, this would have been our wedding day. Would it? I'd forgotten. You haven't forgotten, I said, drawing closer. The first day of spring, a fresh start, you said. I'm so sorry I spoiled everything. I was a fool to have believed Amanda. I was a double fool not to have waited to talk to you first before I married Julian. Let's not talk about it any more, he said with a heavy sigh. It's all over now and finished. Voluntarily, he stepped close enough to draw me into his arms. Kathy, I went away to be alone. I needed that time to think. When you lost faith in me, you turned impulsively but truthfully to the man who has loved you for a number of years. Any fool with eyes could see that. And if you can be honest with yourself, you have been in love with Julian almost as long as he's loved you. I believe you put your love for him on a shelf because you thought you owed me. Stop saying that. I love you, not him. I'll always love you. You're all mixed up, Kathy. You want me, you want him, you want security, you want adventure. You think you can have everything, and you can't. I told you a long time ago April wasn't meant for September. We did and said a lot of things to convince ourselves that the years between us didn't matter, but they do matter. And it isn't only the years, it's the space that would separate us. You'd be somewhere dancing and I'd be here, rooted and tied down but for a few weeks a year. I'm a doctor first and a husband second. Sooner or later you'd find that out and you'd turn to Julian eventually anyway. He smiled and tenderly kissed away the tears I always had to shed, and he told me fate always dealt out the right cards. And we'll still see each other. It isn't as if we're forever lost to one another. And I have my memories of how wonderfully sweet and exciting it was between us. You don't love me, I cried accusingly. You never loved me or you wouldn't be taking this so agreeably. Softly he chuckled and cuddled me close again as a father would. Dear Catherine, my hot-blooded feisty dancer, what man wouldn't love you? How did you learn so much about loving locked away in a cold, dim northern room? from books, I said, but the lessons taught were not all from books. His hands were in my hair and his lips were near mine. I'll never forget the best birthday gift I ever had. His breath was warm on my cheeks. Now, here's the way it's going to be from now on, he said firmly. You and Julian will go back to New York and you will make him the best wife you are capable of being. The two of you will do your damnedest to set the world on fire with your dancing, and you've got to determine never to look back with regrets and forget about me. And you? What about you? He lifted his hand and fingered his moustache. You'd be surprised what this moustache has done for my sex appeal. I might never shave it off. We both laughed, real laughter, not faked. I took then the two-carat diamond ring he'd given me and tried to return it to him. No, I want you to keep that ring. Save it to Hawk when or if you ever need a bit of extra cash. Julian and I flew back to New York and hunted for weeks before we found just the right cozy apartment. He wanted something much more elegant, but between us we didn't earn enough for the penthouse apartment he thought was our due. Sooner or later, though, I'll see we live in that kind of place, near Central Park in rooms filled with real flowers. We don't have time to baby along real plants and flowers, I said, having experienced all the time and trouble it took to keep flowers and plants alive and healthy. 
And when we go to visit Carrie, we can always enjoy Paul's gardens. I don't like that doctor of yours. He's not my doctor. I felt fluttery inside, afraid for no reason at all. Why don't you like Paul? Everybody else likes him well enough. Yeah, I know, he answered shortly, pausing with his fork held midway between his plate and his mouth. He gave me a heavy, solemn look. That's the trouble, my darling wife. I think you like him too much even now. And what's more, I'm not crazy about your brother either. Your sister is okay. You can ask her up for visits once in a while. But don't you ever forget, not for one second, that I come first in your life now. Not Chris, not Carrie, and most of all, not that doctor you were engaged to. I'm not blind or stupid, Kathy. I've seen him look at you. And though I don't know how far you went with him before, you'd better let it be dead now. My head bowed with the panic I felt. My brother and sister were like extensions of myself. I needed them in my life, not just on the fringes. What had I done? I had the blinding precognition that he was going to be my loving keeper, my jailer, and I'd be as imprisoned with him as I'd been in the locked room in Foxworth Hall. Only this time I'd be as free to come and go as far as his invisible chain would allow. I love you like crazy, he said, polishing off the last of his meal. You are the best thing that's ever happened to me. I want you at my side all the time, never out of sight. I need you to keep me straight. I drink too much sometimes, and then I get mean, real mean, Kathy. I want you to make me over into what you think I am on stage. I don't want to hurt you. He touched me then, for I knew he'd been terribly hurt, as I'd been hurt, and he'd been so disappointed in his father as my mother had disappointed me. And he needed me. Maybe Paul was right. Fate had used Amanda to deal out the right cards so Julian and I would be winners, not losers. Youth did call to its own age, and he was young, handsome, a talented dancer, and charming when he wanted to be. He had a cruel dark side, I knew that. I'd experienced some of that. But I could tame him. I wouldn't let him be my ruler and my judge, my superior or my master. We'd make it fifty-fifty, share and be equals. And eventually, one bright and sunny morning, I'd wake up and see his dark, stubbled face and know I loved him. Know I loved him better than anyone I'd loved before. Anyone. Anyone.